What do you think when you hear the power of Christ compels you? The power of Christ compels you. For me, and I think for many, those words conjure up images of projectile vomit, uh, furniture levitating, heads spinning around and around on shoulders, people with blood spilling out of their mouths, speaking in tongues, uh, dark demon-like eyes, children saying the word fuck a lot, uh, low gravelly voices, and a bunch of other creepy, unsettling, spooky shit. I think of the ultra-violent exorcism that Hollywood delights in making movie after oftentimes terrible movie about, but sometimes they kill it. Uh, Watch the 2023 horror flick, The Pope's Exorcist, to get in the uh, right headspace for this episode after Molly Box's recommendation, and it was great. Uh, Anyway, I think of Hollywood when I hear those exorcism words, right? Horror movies. Some great, many not so great. Nearly all of them claiming to be based on a true story. I've actually gotten so used to hearing based on a true story and then seeing a bunch of crazy, over-the-top CGI nightmare scenes. Uh, Sometimes I forget that they actually are based on a true story, that there's some truth behind many of these stories. At least, you know, people are claiming it's true. And the truth for these people is that exorcisms are real. Not saying with scientific certainty that the demons supposedly possessing those being exorcised are real, but the ritual, at least, is for sure real. Exorcism, for sure, they do exist uh, outside of movie sets and are an integral part of the faith for many Catholics and, you know, other members of Abrahamic religions. In fact, uh, did you know that it is required for Catholic children to undergo an exorcism prior to getting baptized? Now, granted, it doesn't look at all like the ones we see on TV, but it's a form of a a minor exorcism, technically just the same. The rites for the baptism of children in the Catholic Church include prayers that designate minor exorcisms, prayers that can be used during or before the baptism ceremony. Uh, So that's what they're saying in Latin, right? To hell with the devil! Uh, What we see on TV and in film is a representation of what is known as a major exorcism, which is only ever used in cases of proven demonic possession and can only be performed by an ordained exorcist. Now, does proven mean proven in a laboratory setting? No, but damn it, if there isn't a lot of spooky as hell stories out there that sure make it seem real. I'll be sharing a classic amongst those stories today. Uh, Let's push past the Hollywood glamour and prosthetics and fake blood and Russell Crowe in a priest's vestment to see what a real Catholic exorcism looks like in today's demonology, ethics of theology, get out of here, devil, edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sex. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, a suck master guy who needs to uh, get some new glasses to keep my eyes from being too evil. Guy who keeps trying to get Greg to wake up. Stop sleeping through other people's nightmares, Greg. And you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina. Praise be to good boy Bojangles and glory be to Triple M. Protect us from these demons. Uh, A couple quick things and then today's show. Uh, For this month's charity announcement, as you know by now, I love New Orleans. It's a place that has touched Lindsay and my souls. About to take my grandma there, Grandma Betty, and a place that we love to spend time in when we can. One of our favorite places there is Preservation Hall. Small, intimate, musical experience like nothing else in the world. Through their foundation, they aim to protect, preserve, and perpetuate New Orleans music and culture through musical education. Supporting them, supporting musicians, supporting history and traditions are all things that matter to us here. Uh, Also, Tyler C. Love this place. So for the month of February, and in honor of Tyler moving on from Bad Magic, we're going to be donating to the Preservation Hall Foundation. Checks a lot of boxes for us. Donating $12,930 to Preservation Hall and putting $1,430 into the scholarship fund. Uh, Thank you so much to our Patreon Space Lizards for making that donation possible. And now for this week's merch announcement. And then it is story time. Got a giant new collection in the store. So many cool new designs to choose from, adding to the ever-growing yearbook collection, which already includes Time Suck staples such as Albert Fish, Ed Kemper. Uh, We now have Jody, Provo Float, Arias, Ronald, Dandelion, Puff, Dominique, Jeffrey, Skidmark, Lundgren, Alex, it's Alec, Murdoch, uh, Dennis, Use Me Already, Nielsen, Rose, Loves a Bad Boy, West, and Fred, Bad Boy, West. Uh, We got the Giga Dan T for our bigger wristed listeners. Out there fucking wrist mogging, mogging people. Uh, we got the sweet Riverside Chili Cook-Off tea, for those who know. Uh, we have a dead giveaway. Dead giveaway. Dead giveaway. Uh, and uh, how about the 2024 Twin Flames Love Soul Retreat Official Ceremonial Attire? 
Also a Colonel Danders, uh, some stuff, a Time Suck whiskey glass, a design that absolutely has nothing to do with Pat Sajak, uh, subtle office polos, and more. So much stuff at badmagicproductions.com, where you can find our store now. Take a browse through the cool designs. Also launched a bunch of Scared to Death merch for Creeps and Peepers as well. And speaking of Scared to Death, uh, if today's subject matter really interests you and you haven't checked it out, uh, please do check out Scared to Death. Now there are new Nightmare Fuel episodes dropped into the Scared to Death feed. Fictional horror written and presented by me, fully scored as well to add maximum chills. Going to want to uh, put the headphones on when you listen to those if possible. And that's it. Now, let's talk about the devil. The power of Christ compels you to listen to all of today's episode. To begin our venture into the pits of hell and the glories of heaven. Uh, We're first going to lay out the groundwork for what an exorcism actually is according to today's Catholic Church and hopefully demystify something that for so many of us exists only in uh, A24 and Blumhouse Films. Love those production companies, by the way. Uh, We will cover how the church defines exorcisms and the different types, who's allowed to perform them and how they get authorized to do so, as well as how the church determines whether or not someone is actually in need of an exorcism. After that, we're going to go through the step-by-step process of how an exorcism in the modern-day church is performed. We'll examine everything from the script the exorcist recites during the ritual to who's permitted to be in the room with him and the possessed while it happens to what the church says the possessed, i.e. the devil, is likely to do and say during an exorcism. Then we'll travel down a treacherous time suck timeline to investigate how the Catholic exorcism became what it is today along our route between the worlds of good and evil. We'll also encounter, in addition to more than a few nefarious demonic entities, a parallel evolution happening as the Catholic exorcism developed over time. So did the non-Christian public's perceptions of it. During the timeline, specifically the closer we get to the 21st century, we'll unearth more than a few instances where things in the secular world, like pop culture, have impacted the perception of an exorcism. We'll start our journey in the first millennium uh, B.C., with Mesopotamians and their tactics for expelling evil spirits. After that, we'll proceed through each major event that impacted the evolution of the exorcism, including the birth of Christ, approximately 2,000 years ago, as well as that fateful day in 1973, when the supernatural horror classic, the iconic movie now, The Exorcist, hit theaters, became a cultural phenomenon. Because today we're only focused on the historical and practical aspects of exorcisms. We're only going to cover one of many documented cases of demonic possession. But don't worry. We'll spend a lot of time with it. Almost like a mini scared to death episode snuck in here. Uh, The particular case we'll talk about is that of Robbie Mannheim or Roland Doe, whose violent possession at the age of 14 inspired the book, The Exorcist, that led to the movie of the same name. Finally, we'll end the timeline in the year of our Lord, 2024, where demand for exorcisms uh, have reportedly increased tenfold. Uh, Quick heads up for the listener, until we get to the timeline, uh, when describing Satan, God, demons, angels, possession, and exorcism, I'm going to do my best to avoid using words like supposedly, or theoretically, or presumably. I'm doing this partly because hearing, according to the Catholic Church, and Catholics believe that, you know, before nearly everything I say about how these entities and rituals work, that'll get pretty old pretty quick. Also doing this in order to convey the information from the perspective of the Catholic Church itself, instead of as an outsider looking in. And I will, other than when we're talking about pre-Christian history, be focusing pretty much exclusively on Catholic exorcism. Other branches of Christianity, other branches of Abrahamic religions also do carry out exorcisms, but I'm not going to get into all that. The classic exorcism is the Catholic exorcism. No church has performed more exorcisms or been performing exorcisms longer than the Pope and his collared homeboys. Uh, With all that out of the way, let's get started. Well, you know, actually, I'm, I'm hesitating because... Uh, technically, there were, I believe there were some uh, Judaic uh, exorcisms before, but again, it's not the, the totality. It's, it's aligned with the Catholic Church. So for you uh, guys who really know your exorcism history, you might be, that, 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 that. I think there were some, some Jewish exorcisms before uh, the Catholic Church got. Actually, there definitely were. You know, Jesus performed exorcisms before the Catholic Church was a thing. I, I know, I know. But the Catholic Church has the, the most robust history. So what is a Catholic exorcism? Well, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops simply says that exorcism uh, is a specific form of prayer that the church uses against the power of the devil. In the church, there are two types of exorcism, major and minor. Uh, I did not know that before this week. I was only familiar with major exorcisms. I just thought that was just what an exorcism was. I didn't know there was a minor and major. 
which is kind of embarrassing to admit for somebody who has co-hosted a paranormal, paranormal podcast that features a lot of demonic possession stories for about five years now. Major exorcisms are the dramatic ones, right? The scary ones, the ones movies get made about. They're reserved only for the most severe cases of proven demonic possession and can only be performed by a trained priest with the blessing of his local bishop. In An Exorcist Tells His Story by the notorious former exorcist of Rome, the Pope's exorcist, a.k.a. the guy Russell Crowe, are you not entertained, portrays in the movie The Pope's Exorcist, Father Gabriele Amorth defines demonic possession as follows in his book, published in 1999, An Exorcist Tells His Story. Demonic possession occurs when Satan takes full possession of the body, not the soul. He speaks and acts without the knowledge or consent of the victim, who therefore is morally blameless. It is the gravest and most spectacular form of demonic afflictions. Uh, in addition to demonic possession, there are four other types of what Father Amorth calls demonic afflictions, also known as extraordinary satanic activity that only require a minor exorcism, which can be like a quick you know, prayer. Uh, in addition to possession, which is the only one that requires major exorcism, the four other types of extraordinary satanic activity are demonic oppression, demonic obsession, demonic infestation, and the least known, demonic patty cake. Uh, demonic patty cake is when you hear a demon nearby and this demon will not stop singing. Patty cake, patty cake, baker's man, bake me a cake as fast as you can. Pat it, prick it, and mark it with the B. Put it in the oven for baby and me. But the demon does it in like a, a scary voice. Patty cake, patty cake, baker's man, bake me a cake as fast as you can. Pat it, prick it, mark it with a B. Put it in the oven for baby and me. And the only way to get the demon to stop is to firmly uh, ask it to stop. Uh, three times, though. Patty cake, patty cake. Ba stop doing that. Patty cake, patty cake. I said stop it. Patty cake, patty Stop it. That's enough. All right, fine. Yeah, you suck and shit. And then they're, and then they're done. And then it's over. Uh, no, the fourth one is demonic subjugation. Uh, quick note. <laughs> I know that was ridiculous. Even more, even more than usual for me. A uh, quick side note. In addition to extraordinary activity, there is also what is known as ordinary satanic activity. That is temptation. Where extraordinary activity is rare, even the milder types that don't require major exorcisms, the devil's temptation is said to be all around us all the time. Okay. Like I said, the first type of extraordinary satanic activity that only requires a mon minor exorcism is called demonic oppression. In cases of demonic oppression, the evil entity has not yet infiltrated the victim's body or gained control of their actions, but it is present in their life. The victim still has their autonomy, so they don't say or do anything involuntary or unconscious. But things like their comfort, health, mental state of finances, employment, relationships, all impacted by the unholy thing that has attached itself to them. Uh, the second form of minor activity is called demonic obsession, unlike possession. Again, in these cases, the victim still has total free will. The demon assaults the person instead by harassing them with reoccurring and constant evil images that it puts into their mind. That sounds absolutely terrible. Like having nightmares when you're awake. Maybe, maybe Carl Watts from last week, old Coral, the Sunday morning slasher, had a case of demonic obsession. Obsession is complicated because it often appears to be a uh, prelude to possession, but it can also uh, be difficult to detect because of its similarities to mental illness. To help avoid confusion, instead of demonic obsession, some exorcists refer to it as psychic demonic vexations or interior demonic vexations or personal demonic infestations. In an essay titled The Extraordinary Ways the Devil Attacks, a head exorcist in an Italian diocese, Father Paolo Carlin, uh, wrote that obsessions can take on diverse forms, levels, and intensities, and finally completely dominate the mind of the person. Given their similarity to psychiatric illnesses, the detection of diabolical obsessions is not always easy. The third form of demonic activity is called demonic infestation. Unlike the previous three, in these cases, the demon does not attach itself to a person, but to a place. Demonic infestation can be identified by unexplainable sounds, odors, lights, shadows, and temperatures. In that same essay, Father Paolo writes that other manifestations one might experience during a demonic infestation are noises or blows on the roof, pavement, walls, doors, windows, or furniture, showers of hailstones that fall as from nowhere on the roof or even in the house, noises of invisible steps, fireworks or explosives, 
the clanging of chains and irons, mysterious voices, cries, laughs, or uproars, invisible bells that clamor, the disappearance of objects that are never found again or are found in the most unusual places in the house, pictures that are detached from the walls and fall without a comprehensible reason, underwear, sheets, blankets, and chairs that levitate in the air, animals such as ravens, bats, reptiles, owls, dogs, or cats that suddenly appear and soon vanish. Sudden, intense, and untraceable burnt odors of excrement, sulfur, rotting flesh or incest, and so forth. Uh, just about every second episode of Scared to Death, uh, that podcast contains at least one example of a possible demonic infestation. The final form of uh, demonic activity, which is not included on every list, but Father Amorth mentions it, so we'll mention it too, uh, is not demonic patty cake, but demonic subjugation or dependence, a.k.a. satanic worship. This type of demonic affliction is voluntary on the part of the human and is most commonly achieved by getting in a blood pact with the devil or making an open and genuine declaration of allegiance and reverence to Satan. Demonic subjugation as well as demonic infestation, obsession and oppression do not require a major exorcism for the evil force can be expelled uh, for the evil force Excuse me, to be expelled only requires a minor one. Minor exorcisms are used to ward off and weaken evil spirits influence on a member of the faithful and actually occur uh, fairly regularly in the Catholic Church. For example, during a baptism, priests uh, perform multiple prayers of exorcism over both the child getting baptized and the salt that is placed in their mouth. Uh, to do so, the, uh, the priest will recite the words. Uh, this is the translation, obviously, not the original Latin. Do not fuck with this baby, demons. God's vengeance will be swift if you shall. For every one baby touched by a demon, God will literally fuck a thousand demons to death in hell. Uh, not those words, actually. Uh, he recites these words. I exorcise thee, O creature salt, in the name of God, the Father Almighty, and in the charity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in the might of the Holy Ghost. I exorcise thee by the living God, the true God, the holy God, by the God who created thee for the protection of the human race. That's just uh, one example of the many minor exorcisms woven into the daily fabric of the Catholic faith. Exorcism is just one small part of a wider theological battleground. The Catholic faith teaches that the war between God and Satan is an ever-present one, and that we are all a part of it, the faithful and non-faithful alike. In this war, demonic possession is just one of the many, many assault tactics used by the Prince of Darkness and his minions against the light of the Lord. And major and minor exorcisms are just two of the many, many defense systems the light has in place to protect its people from its mighty foe. Uh, all right, getting back to the difference now between major and minor exorcisms. Like I said earlier, while minor exorcisms exorcisms uh, help to ward off evil or dilute its influence over a person, major exorcisms are only authorized in cases of extreme evil, muy malvado, where a demon has accomplished full possession of a person and has complete dominion over both their, both their soul and their physical body. Although both major and minor exorcisms are used to combat the devil, they face two very different threat levels. Is the bad guy coming at you with a small pocket knife? Or does he have a boomstick? Like Gage in Army of Darkness. Because of the varying threat level, exorcists approach the devil in two very different ways. Minor exorcisms are deprecatory, which means they are prayers, oftentimes short prayers, directed at God, not the devil. Asking him, as in God, to step in against the evil spirit afflicting someone. Major exorcisms are imprecatory, which means they are prayers directed point blank from the priest to the devil. Like if I was fighting the devil, I might be like, go on, devil, you get, go on, get out of here, you rascal. Get, go on, he hey, ah. And that would be some imprecatory shit, right? Imprecatory shit. There we go. Imprecatory. Uh, I love these words, these technical words that like you never say in conversation unless you're like uh, an exorcist. Uh, imprecatory, imprecatory. God, there we go. The St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology describes it like this. Major exorcism is imprecatory prayer, a direct command. It is critical to understand that imprecatory prayer directly commands a demon, which is a tacit acceptance to a personal battle with that demon. While deprecatory prayer asks God to act against the demon, which brings us to the last big difference between major and minor exorcisms. Who is allowed to perform them? If a minor exorcism is being used for a specific sacrament, such as an official church ritual, then the only person permitted to perform the exorcism is the priest or deacon assigned to that specific ritual. To be clear, though, it is a free country and anyone can say whatever shit they want. The church might not like it, 
But if some demon is after me or somebody I care about, I'm going to say all kinds of shit. I'm not going to ask anyone for permission. Go, go out, damn, get! The power of Christ compels you to hi, 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 the hell on out of here. However, there are a few prayers of exorcism that Catholics are permitted to use in private for personal matters. Major exorcisms, on the other hand, far more exclusive, much, much more. Before we move on, another quick note. Going forward, whenever I say exorcism now, solely referring to a major exorcism, not a minor one. We're done with that minor Bush League farm team bullshit. Only major spooks from here on out. Okay, not just any old priest can be an exorcist. Uh, Exorcist does need to be an older priest, though, but just not any old priest. Uh, Of the approximately 25,000 Catholic priests in the U.S., only 62 of them currently are ordained to perform a major exorcism. However, that number used to be a lot smaller. In 1991, there was one, like one dude, one ordained exorcist in the entire U.S. By 2005, there were still only 12. God, who's that one guy? I picture some old dude just working overtime, fighting demons constantly, just rushing from one exorcism appointment to the next. Just so put upon. He's so fucking over it, right? He's just so jaded, seen it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck me. Fuck God. Yada, yada, yada. Tell me something new already, you hacky demon. I think I haven't heard all this shit a thousand times. Come on. Mock me, priest, and the boy dies. Go ahead. I've already saved four kids today, motherfucker. One dies. My batting average, still excellent. Kill the boy. Or get the hell out of here. If I miss Golden Girls again, I'm going to kill myself, find you in hell, and spend eternity tormenting you. 2012, there were only 250 exorcist priests in the entire world. 2012, slow year. Bad year. Down year for the devil. Satan was tired. He was exhausted in 2012. Just straight up burnout from so many centuries of battling God. Or maybe on vacation, right? I don't know. It's got to be exhausting. Just trying to claim all of humanity's souls all the time. I mean, he, he must have paperwork stacked on his hell desk uh, that just piles up almost all the way to heaven. By 2023, there were 905 exorcists in just 11 years. The number had already quadrupled. If you could buy shares of hell on the stock markets, share price soared going into 2023. So much extra evil going on that had to be battled. We don't have any stats for the uh, the new year, but assuming not much has changed, probably from 2023 to 2024. Uh, currently, of the 905 exorcists, 483 are in Italy, 48 in Mexico, 46 in Brazil. Like I said earlier, 62 in the U.S., uh, just three in China, two in Taiwan, uh, and all of the rest are scattered globally across 52 other countries. Man, so much evil in Italy right now. Why isn't there a travel advisory? Warning. If you are planning on traveling to Italy, please be aware that there is an advisory in place. Demonic forces have taken over much of the country. The Vatican has deployed nearly 500 exorcists in an attempt to take back control of the nation, but several cities, such as Naples, Florence, and definitely Pisa, are currently controlled by the devil. If you still choose to travel to Italy, especially Pisa, please be on high alert for the sounds of scratching on the walls, disembodied voices, Little girls with heads that spin all the way around. And various people, usually but not always, an attractive young woman, scantily clad, with long dark hair, crawling across a ceiling like a creepy nightmare spider. These are but a few indicators of demonic presence. In the last two decades, both the number of exorcisms performed and the number of uh, ordained exorcists in the U.S. has grown exponentially, a trend which many Catholic sources attribute to a rise in pagan and occult practices within our mainstream culture. Fuck. How how much evil have like my Whipple ads alone just added to the depraved and morally decaying world? Ugh. Speaking of Whipple. Today's Time Suck is brought to you by Whipple Demon Edition. Whipple Demon Edition is made out of 30% lesser demons, 40% major demons, and 50% the devil himself. Each 16-ounce can of Whipple Demon Edition is packed with torment. Anguish, sinners being ripped apart, a little bit of that green puke from that girl from The Exorcist, a tiny bit of guava for fucking sinfully delicious and delightful flavor, Whipple Demon Edition will send your soul to hell forever. But before then, it'll allow you to raise the dead, curse your enemies, fuck super hot demon dudes and or goth hell chicks, levitate, scare the shit out of children with your blood red eyes and ability to spider walk up walls and across ceilings and speak any language you want, which is pretty fucking cool. Fuck you, fuck your family, Fuck your soul and drink Whipple 
Demon Edition! Whipple is a proud subsidiary of Bear Evil Incorporated. So anyway, <laughs> there are two ways. I haven't done that in a while. Two ways a priest can become an exorcist. He can either be appointed to the office in perpetuity and thus be an exorcist for as long as he is a priest. Sounds pretty badass. I got to say, to have that as your exclusive job title. Uh, or he can be granted the title for a single occasion. Interesting, the substitute teacher equivalent. Not sure I'd feel great about getting that priest, you know, if my kid needed to be exercised. <laughs> How many times have you done this before? Before? <laughs> before? Uh, no, ne uh, never. No, this is my first exorcism. These things are scary. Hopefully my last. Ugh. Uh, don't worry, though. I watched a lot of movies, and I can probably do it. Uh, the process of getting a major exorcism approved is a long and arduous one. And in most cases, if the church or diocese, which is an ecclesiastical, uh, ecclesiastical district under the jurisdiction of a bishop does not have an exorcist, which is very common, uh, there's still lots of time to call in an already established exorcist from a nearby diocese. Uh, the person who has the power to appoint both career exorcists, that's what the church calls them, uh, or that's, excuse, that's not what the church calls them, that's just uh, what we're calling them. And one hit wonders is the diocesan, diocesan bishop. Uh, and again, uh, and I guess he'd be probably God and probably the Pope if he wants to. You know, if the Pope was like, Father Randall, I appoint you as exorcist. I doubt uh, some cardinals could be like, shut the fuck up, Pope. It's not your job. Stay in your lane, bro. And what is the diocesan bishop? Well, he has one link. And uh, all of these positions are he's, no, no women's bicycles allowed in the giant chain of priesthood command. Uh, at the bottom of the Catholic hierarchy are the faithful who are not part of the clergy. Just regular ass Catholics paying tithes, you know, repeating refrains, uh, probably barely ever being molested. Just pretend you didn't hear that last part. Uh, one up from them are the priests. Each priest presides over a single church, which is a part of a wider territory of churches known again as a diocese. And the diocese as a whole operates under the pastoral control of the diocesan bishop. Uh, there is no hard and fast geographic rule for what constitutes a diocese, but you can think of them as a, about the size of small towns. Each diocese, part of a wider territory of dioceses, and altogether they make up an archdiocese. Archdiocese presided over by, you guessed it, archbishop. Archbishops report to cardinals, some of whom live or at least hold office in the Vatican. Together they compose up the College of Cardinals, and many of the cardinals report directly to the Pope, and everyone reports to God, but mostly the Pope does that. That's a heavily summarized, maybe the, uh, maybe the Pope is best at it, I should say. That's a heavily summarized version that just gives us the gist. Uh, to dig in a lot further, we just, you know, kind of bog down the narrative too much. So only a diocesan bishop can, re, uh, can appoint an exorcist, but it is not required for them to do so. In fact, many dioceses do not. Belief in the devil as an entity that shows up like it does in movies like the Pope's exorcist uh, varies a lot amongst Catholics around the world. Belief is very strong in Italy, for example, hence uh, why they have so many exorcists. 483 in a nation of 59 million people, where 60 to 75% of the nation is Catholic. So on the high end, you know, roughly one exorcist for every 92,000 people. Belief less strong in the U.S., 62 exorcists in a nation of 30, uh, 332 million people, where between 18 and 23% of the population is Catholic. On the high end, roughly one exorcist for every 1.2 million people. Clearly, a lot of Catholic dioceses either don't believe the devil is capable of possessing someone like we see in Hollywood productions here in the U.S., or think instances of actual demonic possession are exceptionally rare. According to a 1614 liturgical text called, this is Latin, it's going to be tricky, uh, De Exorcisandis Obsessis a Demno <laughs> Demonio. Uh, very hard for me to properly pronounce anything in Latin. Uh, I'm going to try my best today. Uh, Latin translates to on exercising the possessed by the demon. The first time the Catholic Church published how to perform their official rites of exorcism, there are a few non-negotiable qualities a priest must have in order to be appointed to the office of exorcist. The priest must be an older, experienced member of the clergy, exact age not given, of outstanding repute and humble attitude, especially wise, prudent, and must be well-read in what the Bible and church have to say about the exorcism process, as well as be familiar with all major cases of demonic possession that the church has faced both in recent years and in the past. Uh, the exorcist must be equipped to carry his work out with charity, humility, and confidence. Most importantly, the priest must have a set of giant stone balls and be prepared to face the devil in battle head on. To hell with the devil. 
Uh, in addition to these qualities, uh, an exorcist hopeful must, in most cases, also have prior experience with assisting in an exorcism. For a great many reasons, we'll soon get into exorcisms are almost never performed by one priest and one priest alone. An exorcist is usually accompanied by one or two other priests who are not ordained exorcists to reinforce his spiritual power with prayers of their own and if need be to help re uh, restrain the possessed person should they become too violent. Uh, this assistant exorcist, if you will, or these assistant exorcists uh, are known officially as weak little baby priests. Every strong, manly, tough guy, giant stone bald exorcist will bring a few weak little baby priests uh, with him to, uh, I don't know, just basically give him something to do, you know, make him feel important. You know, they can go grab him water if he's thirsty, uh, make him a sandwich if he's hungry, rub his back if he's tense, you know, sore and stuff. Uh, weak little baby priests, you know, pretty important part of the exorcism ritual. Uh, and of course, I kid. Uh, there's no special title for these other priests uh, for assisting. They're just, you know, just called priest. In addition to the exorcist, an extra priest during the ritual, the exorcist also usually has a small team of other members of the faith that he is charged with praying for the victim while the case is ongoing. So when seeking an exorcist, a bishop looks to priests who have already been a member of one of these teams who have witnessed the process firsthand. In past years, uh, after a priest was selected, they were sent to the Vatican to be trained in person. Now approved candidates are able to get approved remotely. Program is run by the International Association of Exorcists, which of course is based out of the Vatican. The aim of the course is to ensure well-founded principles and safe guidelines of behavior for future exorcists by helping them to learn those fundamental criteria of discernment in the, in the implementation of the delicate and difficult ecclesial service that will be entrusted to them. In addition to teaching the liturgical action of exorcisms and how to properly perform them, the course is meant to teach candidates how to identify between demonic possession and mental disorders. Uh, over the years, uh, to their credit, and yes, you are hearing me give the Catholic Church a lot of credit here. Uh, the church has worked uh, harder and harder, worked very hard uh, to make sure that more people don't die, you know, malnourished, tortured, tied to a bed because, you know, they were they were mentally ill, needed uh, medical attention as opposed to spiritual attention. And sadly, that has happened a fair number of times over the years. All right. Now to answer the uh, the question everyone's been waiting for. Why do people get possessed and how do they get possessed? Is there a way to avoid it? Short answer is that if you listen to this show, you're clearly not a very righteous person and just kind of ballparking it. I'm going to say there's a 65 to 90% chance that you're going to be possessed by demons at some point in the next few years. If you're not already currently possessed, uh, the devil is going to almost certainly make a skin house out of your soulless corpse and parade you around like a stupid, foolish flesh puppet who you've always been. I'd imagine somewhere around 50% of you are fucking riddled with demons, like stuffed to the gills with demons right now. Like every time you burp or fart, one or two lesser demons slip on out of you. Tell the truth. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've wondered that about myself sometimes. I mean, who hasn't actually let a fart out on occasion that has like an inhuman odor to it, right? Should I be worried? Uh, back to the actual information now. The truth is that in order to answer the questions how and why people get possessed, we first need to understand who and or what demons are. But in order to understand demons... We first have to understand Satan, a.k.a. Lucifer, the prince of darkness, Beelzebub, Mes <laughs> Mephistopheles, Baphomet, the Antichrist, Pat Sajak, the king of hell, Old Harry. Old Harry uh, really is what some people used to call Satan. It doesn't pack the same punch as some of Satan's other nicknames. Be gone, Satan. Leave this place, prince of darkness. I forsake you back to the pits of hell, Old Harry. Uh, also, some of the names I listed, like Baphomet, considered to be the name of a demon, not the devil himself. Now, we don't have enough time to cover the Great Deceiver's wretched backstory in its entirety, because frankly, it's too long and too confusing. But we'll cover the most basic premise of it. We all know that Satan was once God's favorite. In fact, he was once the most perfect being created by the hands of the Lord and in, the, and in heaven's hierarchy surpassed all other angels. Uh, he was once, if you will, God's goody two-shoes, daddy's boy, sweetie pie angel, buddy dude. But my, how he has changed. Uh, his name wasn't Satan. As an angel in heaven, he was Lucifer. Uh, interestingly, in early translations of the Bible, in the late fourth century Vulgate, uh, prepared largely by St. Jerome, one of the first translations of the Bible into Latin, Lucifer appeared not as the name of a devil, but as the Latin word Lucifer, uncapitalized, meaning the morning star, the planet Venus, or as an adjective, light bringing. Uh, Lucifer grew dissatisfied with his position in heaven. 
As powerful as he was, he didn't want to be subservient to God. He wanted to be God. He had an ego bigger than his wingspan. And he started a rebellion to usurp his creator. According to the book of Revelation, a third of the angels joined Satan in his unsuccessful insurrection. And as punishment, both he and his mutinous followers were thrown out of heaven and into the bowels of hell for eternity. Uh, Revelation 12, 7, uh, verse 7 through 10. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Uh, Since then, Satan and his fucking demon goon dipshit friends have only had one goal, to enslave and torment all of humanity by getting them to obey their God and turn their souls over to him in hell. A statement from the fourth Lateran Council of Pope Innocent III explains Lucifer and his posse like this. The devil and the other demons were created good by God, but they became evil through their own fault. Okay, I expect it to be a little bit longer, but oh, yeah, it's fine. Uh, While most consider Satan to be a metaphor for evil or an abstract conceptualization of morality, according to scripture, that's heresy, Satan is not a metaphor. He's a real living entity who we all must be uh, wary of lest we fall prey to his evil ambitions. However, that doesn't mean that there isn't some disagreement even within the clergy about the specifics of Satan's life and how big of a threat he poses to mankind. Uh, for instance, Father Amorth takes a very literal, or, or took, he's passed away, but you know, took a very literal stance on how God's favorite fell from grace. In an exorcist tells a story, he wrote that not only was Satan the most perfect and powerful being created by God, but that in heaven, he actually had an actual throne to sit on and was in charge of governing certain dominions and principalities. How does he claim to know this? Uh, I would guess through the study of the teachings of various theologians, many of them from medieval Europe and through biblical interpretation. And he wrote, God never rejects his creatures. Therefore, even though they broke with God, Satan and his angels maintain their power and rank. Those thrones, dominions, and principalities, even if they use them for evil purposes. Uh, And regarding the devil's evil purposes, Father Amorth writes, St. Augustine does not exaggerate when he claims that if God gave Satan a free hand, no man would be left alive. Meaning if Satan had God's power, you know, humanity would already be lost. Uh, because Satan just can't kill us all willy-nilly, he tries to do the next best thing to uh, piss off, excuse me, <clears throat> Earth Sky Daddy. And that's to get us to disobey God, turn our backs on the Lord, just as he did. He was somewhat successful with Adam and that OG shrub slut Eve. <laughs> if you know, you know. Uh, and it seemed he would continue to be successful until Christ came along and established the kingdom of God on Earth, a spiritual realm for us lowly, earthly meat sacks where God reigns as king. Uh, however, Although Jesus destroyed the work of the devil and established the kingdom of God on earth, that wasn't the end of the battle and the war between God and his fallen angel is still ongoing. This is because between the last time Jesus stopped by and his next scheduled visit, the second coming, Satan is trying to gather as many souls as he can to use in a war against his enemy. In his arrogance, he thinks he can destroy God and he's throwing anything and everything he has at humanity to prepare for his big fight. And he's coming for all of us, but he's making a lot harder push for some of us, for some of our souls and others. Uh, Satan does not target a single group. He targets all people, no matter where they live, how old they are, uh, what they believe. In one interview, Pope Francis said, what is certain is that the devil tries to attack everyone without distinction and tries above all to strike those who have more responsibilities in the church or in society. We are human beings and he will always try to attack us. So while he tries to attack everyone, he tries a lot harder. He prefers to target the most faithful and or, and or most important people. And uh, that's uh, it's kind of hard to hear, actually, because I don't I don't think I've ever been targeted, you know, and it kind of bothers me that the devil hasn't come after me. I mean, is the devil just down there thinking, <laughs> Cummins, who gives a shit? That loser is a complete waste of my time. Well, fuck you, too, Beelzebub. I don't even care that you don't want me. My feelings are even hurt a little bit. You see water in my eyes. That's allergies, man, bro. I, I have year round allergies. Okay. Uh, anyway, Satan is waging war against the light, does not care how many casualties are caused, uh, you know, left in his path to total dominion, total domination. So he attacks on a global scale. However, according to the church, during periods of great sinfulness, Satan's presence is more evident. And apparently we are currently in one of those periods. Is that why so much good music is being made right now? Is that why it's easier uh, than it's ever been in my lifetime to find good quality party drugs and psychedelics? Is that why there are so many fun sex toys? On the market right now, incredible lingerie, uh, so much high def, totally free porn uh, featuring the best bodies on the planet. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Satan, I guess. Uh, I know demonic possessions are not fun, but maybe a little bit of Satan? I don't hate it. Hail Lucifina. Uh, in addition to an increase in Western consumerism, materialism, socialism, communism, and hedonism, Satan's success is largely attributed to a decline in the number of people worshiping the Christian God via the Catholic Church. And before I share what Father Amorth has to say about that, I want to add that I'm not surprised at all that communism is on the list of satanic things. I fucking knew it was evil. So did Bojangles. Uh, regarding that dip in Catholicism, Father Amorth writes, we can see the proliferation, especially among the young, of spiritism, witchcraft, the occult, yoga, okay, zen, transcendental meditation. These are all practices based in reincarnation on dissolving the human person into divinity or in any case on other doctrines that are unacceptable to Christians. Anyone else think it's funny that yoga got thrown in there? I mean, I guess I'm not totally surprised that yoga is a little satanic. I mean, seeing women in yoga pants sometimes for sure gives me devilish thoughts. Hail to Uh Whoever helped popularize yoga pants, uh, thank you. Back to our original question. Why slash how do people get possessed? Father Amorth describes four primary reasons people fall victim to extraordinary satanic activity. The first reason is simply that God allows it. In these cases, the victim is completely blameless and has done nothing to increase his or her chances of demonic affliction. They've simply fallen prey to the external actions of the free will having devil. Uh, but also, you're a sinner, right? All of you. Sin is what allows all possession to take place. So maybe you're not 100% completely blameless. If you could have just never, ever sinned once in your life, not one time, you'd be okay. Uh, it is through sin that the devil gains influence and eventually dominion over someone's soul, which opens him or her up to possession. Uh, if you do get randomly possessed, it's important to note that this doesn't mean that God has abandoned the person who is randomly afflicted. Father of Morth writes, uh, nothing happens without God's permission. God always allows normal satanic activity and gives us all the graces necessary to resist it with the resulting good of strengthening our spiritual life. In the same manner, God at times also allows extraordinary satanic activity to increase our humility, patience, and mortification. Interesting. So, so God, in a roundabout way, is kind of the reason we have all this porn right now. God uh, wants us to have it. I mean, I mean, to increase our, you know, uh, humility, of course, but, you know. Uh, the next reason people get possessed is because they don't go pee-pee in the potty like good boys. God hates it. We don't go pee-pee in the potty like a good boy or like a good girl. And he will for sure allow the devil to slap your soul around and torment you. No, uh, the next reason people get possessed is because they're the target of an evil spell. Uh, like those in the first category, people subjected to a curse are in no way guilty for their current condition. However, unlike the first category where the only autonomous action comes from Satan, in these cases, you know, there's some human activity involved. When someone falls under an evil spell and becomes possessed, it is because another person has invoked the devil and beseeched him to intervene on their behalf. Should be noted that far from all members of the church or even members of the clergy do believe that evil curses cast by humans are like a, a thing, a possibility. Uh, this belief much more prevalent in medieval times. So if you do get cursed, uh, take some comfort in knowing that there's a, there's a real good chance that literally no one is going to believe you. If you get cursed, take, please take some comfort in knowing that you are fucked. No one's going to ever help you. I guess that's probably not very comforting. Uh, the final reason that people get possessed is because they associate with evil people or evil places. Uh, Father Amorth writes that this category includes the practice or assisting in the practice of seances, witchcraft, satanic cults, or sex, which culminate in black masses, the occult, as well as associating with warlocks, witch doctors, or certain types of card readers. These are all activities that make us vulnerable to evil spells. If we go so far as to desire a relationship with Satan, there is such a thing as consecration to Satan, the blood pact with Satan, attendance at satanic schools, and the election to the priesthood of Satan. Uh, Father Morth's words here uh, have really led to me doing a lot of uh, serious reflection, a lot of contemplation. I had to ask myself over the last few days, have I ever associated with warlocks? And you know what? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I feel stupid saying this, but I don't think I've ever screened my friends and family for warlocking or for witch doctoring. And that's a big mistake as I'm seeing now. When I get home tonight, I'm going to make sure that neither Lindsay nor my daughter Monroe are fucking warlocks. If either one of them says yes, or I don't believe them when they say no, immediate punch to the face. Be gone, warlock. Get out of here. To hell with the devil. To hell with the devil. Lindsay does fuck around a lot with crystals. Feels witchy. 
Makes me nervous. Also, can dogs be warlocks? If one of my dogs is a warlock, oh, it is for sure Penny Pooper. Ginger Bell, much too sweet. Or is that a trick? I might have two little warlock doodles at home. Sorry, I'll try and push pause on my sarcastic bullshit. After this next thing, I'm going to say, satanic schools? I'm pretty sure that's not a thing. Uh, if you know of any satanic schools, please shoot me an email or DM uh, with the link. I'd be curious what you're studying. I'd love to hear more about it. Uh, okay, now that we know who Satan is, what he wants, why he goes around possessing folks, let's meet the last piece of the possession puzzle, the fucking demons themselves. According to prominent Italian 13th century Dominican friar, priest, philosopher, theologian, virgin, Thomas Aquinas, demons like Satan were made by God and they were made to be good. Also like Satan, they became evil through their own fault. Demons are the angels that joined Satan, as I mentioned, in his rebellion against God, were cast out of heaven for doing so. In hell, they continued to be subservient to their prince of darkness. Uh, despite their excommunication to the underworld, demons still maintain some angelic qualities, though. For instance, a lot of them can still play real mean harp. Check out this little ditty recorded by the demon Gargamel. I mean, uh, Gamigan. It's nice, it's soothing. I mean, not bad. And apparently completely self-taught. <laughs> Color me impressed, demon. Color me impressed. Wow. Okay. Uh, real quick before I move on from this silliness, when I tried to figure out how to properly say the demon Gamigan's name, <laughs> I came across this video that was cracking me the fuck up. This channel is uh, Working Dragon Mystic. And the video is titled The Demon Gamigan uh, Slash uh, Saminga. This one I always found interesting because if you'll notice with the Goetic <laughs> sigils, when you look them up on Google or anywhere, mm -hmm. you'll notice the name of the entity is around the sigil. Oh. Um, there is a G in the names of this, so it uh -huh. never really caught my attention. Uh -huh. However, yeah. when I was working with this entity and um, talking with it, uh -huh. The entity corrected me on its name and asked me to please call it Samgina. Samgina, okay. Um, Sam, Sam, okay, I said Samgina. That kind of threw me off for a little bit, but um, when I looked at the sigil, Sam I realized if you look around the border, the sigil I was using, and online, that's actually what's on the border of uh -huh. most of them. How nice of the demon to, you know, really point out, like, no, 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 it's a... Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, Sam, Sam, Samgia, or whatever the fuck he said, Samgina. Sam Samgina. There we go. Thank you, Dragon Mystic. Dragon Mystic, by the way, looks like a satanic private detective from the 1940s. Uh, very interesting uh, <laughs> kind, of, kind of attire. I like it. It's just, you know, it's unique. Okay. Like angels of light. Uh, demons are immortal and powerful. Each has unique capacity for knowledge, intelligence, and skill. Additionally, like angels, demons also desire to be part of a hierarchy. Hence their allegiance to Satan, right? Everyone likes a little structure. Children. Students, demons, all demons, including Satan, uh, who is a demon himself, albeit the most powerful, also have the ability to change to take on any desired form, including that of an angel of light. Although demons are sexless, it is also possible for them to appear in the form that is alluring and beautiful to someone in order to seduce someone into sin. Hail Lucifina! If I do have to be attacked by a demon, I want to be a sexy-ass lady demon. Uh, much of our Western conceptualization of demons' appearance comes from artists and authors from centuries far removed from the writing and or compilation of the Bible, such as Francisco Goya's 1798 painting, The Witch's Sabbath, which depicts a goat, Satan, with large horns and a crown of oak leaves, sitting like a human man with some witches laying around him. Uh, while the devil is rarely depicted in any form with a biblical basis, the association between demons and horns actually does have its roots in the Bible. Revelations 13.1, for example, describes... A beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, and on its horns were ten diadems, and on its heads were blasphemous names. Sounds like Cthulhu's cousin, some kind of Lovecraftian monster. Uh, later, Revelations 13.11 details another demon that rose out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, when it spoke like a dragon. Although the Bible doesn't give any exact statistics about exactly how many demons are roaming around in hell, philosophers, theologians, priests, preachers throughout the centuries, Random dipshits like me have made guesses based on the biblical statement that a third of heaven's angels were cast out down to the underworld. In 1467, Spanish priest Alfonso de Spina claimed that the uh, the total population of demons was 
316,666. And that's a shit ton of demons. Not sure what kind of special demon calculator helped him get to that number. 1583, another estimation was put forth by physician Johann Weir. Johann Weir, who just declared that there were a 4 million, uh, 4 million 439,622 demons in total. That's way less. How did that guy come up with that number? Well, easy. He said there were 66 demonic nobles who governed 666 different demonic legions, and each legion comprised of 6,666 individual lesser demons. It's a lot of demons still. Now, those exorcist totals, uh, you know, that I went over earlier seem uh, extremely low. Right? Back in 1991, the U.S. had one ordained exorcist, even though there were 253 million people in a world of 5.4 billion people. Right? That's a lot of souls. There were at least four and a half million demons in the world, possibly so many more. Since the U.S. had 4.6 of the world's population, that means that it also had a little over uh, 200,000 demons. Over 200,000 demons for one exorcist. God, I guess that guy must have died from demon exhaustion. Maybe there were fewer demons back then. Uh, there is quite a bit of debate on whether or not the total number of demons remains constant and you know, fixed or changes. Some argue that because demons are the original fallen angels, none can be subtracted or added to their ranks. Thus, the number of how many of them there are never changes. Others argue that because they are, uh, they are occasionally referred to as evil spirits in the Bible, that means that a malevolent and sinful person could maybe become a demon in the afterlife. How many of the serial killers that we've covered here are still fucking with people on earth as demons? Sunday morning slasher from last week? Oh, for sure a demon right now. If this is possible. Some also think that sometimes demons are created when humans uh, fuck angels. Or when angels fuck humans. Not kidding. Uh, this does actually happen in the Bible. Genesis 6 verses 1, two, uh, 1 through 2 read, When men began to multiply on the face of the land, the daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. And these sons of God, seen by many as angels. The human angel hybrid hypothesis uh, doesn't actually have a lot of supporters though, which is a bummer because it sounds pretty hot. Whether or not demons can also be, in addition to fallen angels, the spawn of the sons of God and the daughters of man or the hostile souls of the dead, one thing pretty universally agreed upon by believers is that there's a fuck ton of them. Despite this, uh, the Bible though uh, only uh, mentions a few by name. The demon Abaddon. For example, referenced in Revelations 9-11, where he's described as the angel of the bottomless pit, a destructive force from the underworld whose main prerogative is inflicting woe and despair upon mankind. His name is derived from the Hebrew word for destruction or doom. Also described as the uh, king of an army of locusts. And in the Vulgate, he's described as a destroyer of souls. Uh, Described as an insatiable entity, always lusting for more power, more destruction, more pain. Uh, Interestingly, some Methodist and Jehovah's Witness publications have described Abaddon as one of God's angels, though, not one of Satan's minions, described as a powerful warrior entity who fights not for the devil, but for God, a destroyer of evil forces. Another demon called out by name in the Bible is Molech, who is at his most powerful during the reign of King Solomon. Molech is a particularly fucked up demon in demonology lore because his favorite thing to do is trick people into thinking he's a god of light and worshiping him. And eventually, uh, you know, tricking them into sacrificing their children in his name. Molech was once an ancient Canaanite deity, often depicted as a bronze bullheaded idol with outstretched hands over a fire. And there are so many other demons that come mostly from the musings of medieval theologians or occultists. Many of the names of demons spoken about in demonology circles today come from the lesser key of Solomon, an anonymously authored grimoire, a book of magic or sorcery that names 72 powerful demons such as Zapar, a great duke of hell who commands 26 legions of inferior spirits. He's a demon of lust and sodomy who loves to trick women by showing up as their lover and then leaving them barren with his touch. Vlak, the demon, the demon from the conjuring universe, shows up in the Lesser Key of Solomon. He is a great president of hell, mighty, having 30 legions of demons under his command, often depicted as a small boy with angel wings riding a two-headed dragon or maybe as a scary-ass demon nun in recent days. Then there's Greg. (laughs) Greg is the sleepiest of all sleepy-ass demons. Greg demon appears as a normal-looking dude, shows up in places where people are about to get murdered in order to give victims false hope and have them think that there's someone nearby who is going to call the police or help them in some way like a fucking normal person would. But Greg instead just nods off and falls asleep after seeing you start to be attacked. He doesn't do shit. He just straight up just lets you get murdered. 
Little nod to last week's sucker. If you're very curious what the hell I'm talking about right now. Uh, during an exorcism, if a demon reveals his name to be uh, one from the Bible or a traditional name uh, for Satan, such as Beelzebub, Lucifer, Zebulun, Meridian, Asmodeus, then that means they are especially powerful and difficult to exorcise. Although evil takes many forms and acts in unpredictable ways, there are a few things an exorcist can be sure to expect from a demon during an exorcism. First of all, the demon will do everything he can to avoid being discovered. Oftentimes, it's not until the power of the exorcism ritual makes it suffer so much that the demon is forced to reveal itself, but even then, it might take a few tries. Father Amorth writes that sometimes it is not until the second or third blessing that the demon will reveal itself. He writes that, At times, the revelation is progressive. Some possessed appear to have a different sickness at each session. Some possessed individuals are silent and immobile, and if provoked, any reaction is limited to the eyes. Others fling themselves about, and unless they are held down, they harm themselves. Others wail, especially if they are blessed with the sign of the cross or with holy water. During an exorcism, demons are also very reluctant to talk. If one does speak, it will continue to lie about its identity until it is no longer able to. It will also do everything it can to distract the exorcist from his task and avoid his questions, hurl threats of harm and perversion at him, and reveal the ugliest sins of each person in the room. Can you imagine if that actually happened to you? Like if some person seemingly possessed by a demon, right? Revealed some some deeply held secret of yours. Something that you had never told anyone. Like you knew it couldn't know that naturally. Don't lecture me about God, banana peel fucker. Do you still think about Rhonda and her big titties when you see a banana Daniel? Do you still want them? Uh, do you want to take it into the grocery store and fuck the peel? Right? And then everyone present at the exorcism is just staring at me like, what? What did that demon just say? <laughs> That's, I, was, I don't know. That was weird. That's crazy. That's crazy shit. That the demon thinks that I did. I definitely, I never did. That's real weird. Are you going to also deny fucking your stepmother's throw pillows, Daniel? Going to bed soon, Daniel? <laughs> shit. Yeah, this is crazy. Uh, it's clearly not demonic possession. Just the ramblings of, uh, they're mentally ill. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off. You know, since there's, there's definitely not a demon present. This is a waste of our time. Time to go home and eat five or six Oreos, Daniel. When you, when you, no one's looking and then act like you don't know why your weight is not going down, Daniel. Uh, for real though, someone started looking all fucking crazy and then started sharing secrets of mine. I knew I had not told anyone. Oh, that changes my life a lot. I am now a very firm believer. Devil, demons, God, all of it for the rest of my life. That would be the most terrifying, but also maybe weird to say about demonic possession, but most beautiful experience of my life. Like undeniable proof of the supernatural. How cool. I mean, I mean, even if revealed in a horrifying way, how amazing to really know that a world apart from science 100% exists. Uh, a telltale verbal sign of a demonic presence is that they're able, or excuse me, that they're unable to speak holy names. Instead, the demon will only refer to God and Jesus as he, Mary as her, or, you know, slurs. Uh, when a demon's strength and hold on their victim begins to weaken, the rhetoric will change. Father Amorth writes, for a demon to leave a body and go back to hell, means to die forever and to lose any ability to molest people actively. He expresses his desperation during exorcisms with words such as these. I am dying. I am dying. I can't take it any longer. Enough. You are killing me. You are murderers. Hangmen. All priests are murderers. And similar sentences. I hadn't heard about that before, that the demon is banished to hell forever. It's not how it works in the movies. All right, now let's go uh, over step-by-step step on how to perform an exorcism according to the, again, the Latin coming up, D exorcisandis obsessis a dumb demonio on exercising the possessed by the demon. Published in 1614, the first official version of the ritual. Uh, this version of the rite of the exorcism actually went unchanged all the way until 1999, when it was completely rewritten by the Holy See, the central government of the Catholic Church, led by the Pope. Uh, the title of the new version of the ritual is, more Latin, De Exorcimis, et <laughs> Supplicationibus, Quizbustam, uh, something like that, uh, or Of Exorcisms and Certain Supplications. Although it's acceptable to use either edition, we're going to focus on the English translation of the original 1614 text, and then just give a brief summary of how the 1991 or 1999 one differs. De Exorcandis. Uh, begins with some preliminary instructions for the exorcist and reiterates the qualities he should have. We went over these a little earlier, but just to recap, the exorcist should be old, well-read, devout, humble, someone swinging a huge pork sword, a.k.a. tube steak, a.k.a. love baton, a.k.a. one-eyed wonder weasel over those giant stone balls and have exceptional integrity. 
Just forget about the wiener talk. Uh, the introduction to the ritual offers a very brief warning to the exorcist. Claims that he should not believe too readily that the person is possessed by an evil spirit, but he ought to ascertain the signs by which a person possessed can be distinguished from one who is suffering from melancholy or some other illness. Uh, as we'll see later, this was uh, one thing that the 1999 revision made significant changes to in the ritual, where the original is uh, not unconcerned, but less concerned with the possibility of misdiagnosing an exorcism. The new version puts uh, ensuring that a person is actually possessed and not suffering from any mental or physical ailment is a, a top priority for the exorcist. In fact, the 1614 De Exorzandis uh, even warns the exorcist that the devil might try to trick him by making the possession appear like a worldly condition such as mental illness. It says, the evil spirits place whatever obstacles they can in the way so that the patient may not submit to exorcism or try to convince him that his affliction is a natural one. The devil might also try to deceive the exorcist by answering his questions in confusing and maddening ways so that he gives up or by making the victim appear to be liberated. Uh, before I read what the book says about this, I need to share something. Not kidding. Uh, as I first began to work on this part of the notes, and as I'm recording, this was just like yesterday afternoon for me, I looked at it in my backyard. I'm sitting at home working on it, and I watched, I think it was a small hawk, uh, pretty small, land on what looked like a sparrow. I'm not a, I'm not a bird expert. So who knows if I'm getting these bird names right. But one bird about the size of what a small hawk, I think, is landed on another bird that seemed to be about the size of a little sparrow, just straight up fucking sm smashed him. And the, and the bigger bird seemed to squeeze and suffocate the smaller bird with its talons. And it just fucking stood there, seemingly staring at me through the sliding glass door, standing on this little bird that's fluttering, trying to get away as it's dying. And then the bird stops fluttering, and this creepy bigger bird flies off with the dead little bird in its talons. That happened right as I'm getting to this part. Like never, ever have seen that happen in my yard before or in anybody else's yard. It was creepy ass timing. The devil sent me a message. Uh, and now here's what the book says about the, uh, the demon tricking the exorcist. Once in a while, after they are already recognized, they conceal themselves and leave the body practically free from every molestation so that the victim believes himself completely delivered. Sometimes the devil will leave the possessed person in peace and even allow him to receive the Holy Eucharist to make it appear that he has departed. In fact, the arts and frauds of the evil one for deceiving a man are innumerable. Another way a demon might try to trick the exorcist is by insisting that it is not a demon, might instead claim to be a spirit of a saint, deceased loved one, even an angel from heaven. But no matter what, the exorcist must never give credence to the devil. The preliminary instructions also include a short li uh, list of potential signs of possession. And these are the ability to speak with some facility in a strange tongue or to understand it when spoken by another. The faculty of divulging future and hidden events. Display of powers which are beyond the subject's age and natural condition. Uh, and various other indications which, when taken together as a whole, build up the evidence. Like we went over earlier, the exorcism should take place in the church, but if the victim is too weak to be moved, then their home is acceptable. Either way, it should always be performed in private. If the victim is in good enough physical health, then in preparation for the exorcism as well as during it, they should fast regularly, go to confession as often as they can, and receive Holy Communion as much as possible. During the exorcism, the priest should keep a crucifix at hand. If it is possible, they should also take the relics of saints, such as their personal items or manuscripts, secure them in a safe container, container, and place them on the breast of the victim. It is vital that no harm is done to the holy objects. The exorcist should also only stick to the script during the ritual. Even if he's tempted, he should never ask, uh, quote, superfluous questions, superfluous questions, excuse me, or questions that are prompted by curiosity, particularly if they pertain to future and hidden matters, all of which have nothing to do with his office. Instead, he will bid the unclean spirit keep silence and answer only when asked. Uh, however, there are some questions the exorcist is authorized to ask the demon. For example, it is acceptable to inquire about the names of the demons, how many of them there are, when they possess the victim, and why they possess the victim. And yes, multiple demons. Uh, you can be possessed by more than one demon, by a legion of demons. You can have a demon orgy going on inside you. The exorcist is also permitted to ask uh, through what means the demon is possessing the victim. And, quote, command the devil to tell whether he is detained in that body by necromancy, by evil signs or amulets. In the Catholic Church, amulets can be defined as any sort of perceived to be magical object associated with superstition and therefore paganism. 
In today's world, an example of an amulet that would be seen as heresy by the church is the evil eye, a talisman shaped like an eye, thought to protect people from the evil eye. Evil eye, a supernatural belief that a malevolent glare can be a sign that you're being cursed. The belief has existed since prehistoric times with amulets to protect against this dating back about 5,000 years. The use of crystals, Lindsay, also prohibited. Uh, The anti-amulet and subsequently anti-magic charges date back to the 4th century AD when the church decreed that members of the clergy were forbidden to be sorcerers, conjurers, or to wear amulets. Should a member of the clergy be found practicing magic or wearing slash owning an amulet, they will be excommunicated. Their very souls condemned to be separated from God's love forever. Uh, Now you might be asking yourself, doesn't the Catholic Church basically have amulets of its own? Like the pictures and medals of saints or those relics of martyrs we were just talking about. Aren't those basically amulets? Well, the church would say no. No, they are not. According to multiple sources, unlike amulets, these objects are not thought to have any inherent power or divinity within them uh, or simply just by themselves can ensure anything like safety or success. They are used, quote, not because it is believed that any divinity or virtue is in them for which they are to be revered or that anything may be asked from them or that any confidence can be placed in the images, but because the honor which is exhibited to them is referred to the prototypes which they represent. Just a little reminder, you know, to be a good person because you got a little picture of a good person hanging around your neck. Uh, okay, back to the 1614 day exorosandis. It goes on to say that uh, should an amulet be assisting the devil in possessing the victim, it must be removed immediately. Uh, if it is found that the victim has ingested the amulet, sounds painful, then, quote, he should be made to vomit them. The exorcist always being conscious of the potential requirement, this be done by a competent physician. If he has them concealed on his person, he should expose them. And when discovered, they must be burned. It is stressed the victim should reveal to the priest if he feels tempted to continue hiding the amulet, amulet or to ingest it again. Uh, during the exorcism, the exorcist should pose every question, prayer, demand, and threat with a commanding and authoritative voice. Prior to the start of the ritual, the exorcist should also know the full proper name of the victim as well as their nickname so they can address what they say directly and distinctly to them and not to the demon. De exorcandis warns that the more authoritative the priest is, the more vexed the demon will become and the more it will try to undermine his power by, with a lack of a better word, uh, goofing off. In that case, the priest should do his best to ignore and denounce the devil's games and mockery. Quote, As for all jesting, laughing, and nonsense on the part of the evil spirit, the exorcist should prevent it or condemn it, and he will exhort the bystanders, whose number must be very limited to pay attention to such goings-on. Neither are they to put any questions to the subject. What kind of nonsense do demons get up to? Now I'm picturing some possessed person standing up, doing a lot of fucking big hip gyrations and thrusts, you know, weird grin on their face while saying super weird nonsensical shit like, I bet you wish you could chew on the ice cream, don't you, priest? Chew it up and spit it out. And then they pretend to ride an invisible horse just, just around the room. Is this what a sexy monkey looks like? Auntie Roger still skin? Bet you can't guess my toe jam, can you, priest? And it's like weird giggles and shit. What is this, Father Sarducci? It is nonsense, Father Luigi. This is demonic nonsense. Uh, if any swelling, irritation, cuts, bruises, or other physical wounds appear on the body of the patient during the ritual, then the priest should trace the sign of the cross over the afflicted area and sprinkle it with holy water. Although the exorcist is not required to trace the sign of the cross using oil that has been anointed, it is advisable. Uh, one of the few people permitted to attend the exorcism is the exorcist assistant, who can either be another exorcist or more likely uh, just an experienced priest. The assistant's primary job, in addition to prayer, is to restrain the victim should the demon become exceptionally violent. Additionally, the assistant is tasked with keeping the holy objects like the cross, holy water, saints' relics on hand and safely guarded. Because of the sanctity and potential danger of the exorcism ritual, the priest, assistant, and victim should be the only people present for it. That is, uh, unless the possessed person is a woman. If that is the case, then the exorcist is required to also be attended or the, uh, the exorcism is required to also be attended by several reputable female relatives of the woman Quote, who will hold on to the person when she is harassed by the evil spirit. Can't have the priest touching her. Can't, can't leave those priests around a possessed lady. The devil would certainly use her to test their ability to remain uh, celibate, to resist seduction. In order to protect himself from Satan's cunning, the ritual book also says that the exorcist should be prepared to have the demon reveal the exorcist's sins, especially those which he has forgotten and not confessed and those for which he has not received absolution. It therefore is prudent that the exorcist confess and receive absolution immediately prior to each exorcism session. 
but not merely to avoid embarrassment, but primarily to protect his own immortal soul. And that is exactly what Russell Crowe had to deal with in The Pope's Exorcist. Uh, Once the exorcist is fully prepared to take the devil head on, he can uh, begin the ritual. For the exorcism of a single individual, the priest begins by tracing the sign of the cross over himself, over the possessed person, and over the bystanders, and then sprinkles everyone with holy water. The possessed person should be placed before the priest, either standing, sitting, laying down, or if need be, restrained in either of the last two positions. The exorcist then kneels and prays the litany of saints, and after each line, the bystanders in the room recite the accompanying response. The prayer starts with, Lord, have mercy on us. And then all the bystanders repeat, Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. And then it goes on for 122 more verses of call and response. The final line the bystanders recite is, deliver us from evil. After that, the exorcist delivers Psalm 53, which is meant to imbue those present with courage against powerful forces of evil and recites a prayer asking for strength from God. The exorcist then speaks directly to the demon reciting, I command thee, unclean spirit, whosoever thou art, along with all thine associates who have taken possession of this servant of handmaid of God, that by the mysteries of the incarnation, passion, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the descent of our Holy Spirit, by the coming of our Lord unto judgment, thou shalt tell me by some sign or other thy name in the day and the hour of thy departure. I command thee, Moreover, to obey me to the letter, I, who though unworthy, am a minister of God, neither shalt thou be emboldened to harm in any way this creature of God, nor the bystanders, nor any of of their possessions. Pretty cool shit. After that, the exorcist reads at least uh, one of the selected passages from the Gospels over the possessed person. The exorcist then fortifies himself and the possessed person by making the sign of the cross, placing the end of his stole, Right, that long, narrow, scarf-like vestment that symbolizes a priest's authority and role as a mediator between God and the people. On the neck of the victim, his right hand on their head, and speaking another prayer, imploring God to help with what is to come next. Then the priest begins reciting the first actual prayer of exorcism. It's approximately 2,000 words long, broken up into three sections, can be repeated as many times as needed until the victim is delivered from Satan's grasp. Although it does incorporate a few more prayers to God, this portion of the ritual mostly consists of commands and threats addressed directly to the devil. It's like what we were talking about earlier with right major exorcisms being imprecatory. This is uh, where the priest, strengthened by the light of God, enters a one-on-one battle with the demon to force it uh, out instead of asking God to do it for him. The first section begins with the priest commanding, I cast thee out, unclean spirit. Go on and get, you little evil rascal! Get the heck out of here, you naughty little bad boy! You don't ever go pee beyond the party know how! You quit it! You just quit it! In the name of Lord Jesus Christ, I need you to knock it the heck off! No one likes you here, you little liar, liar, pants on fire, wicked, poopy face boy! Actually, here's what it really says. I cast thee out, thou unclean spirit, along with the least encroachment of the wicked enemy and every phantom and diabolical legion. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, depart and vanish from this creature of God. For it is he who commands thee, he who ordered thee, cast down from the heights of heaven into the nethermost pit of the earth. Hence, pay heed, Satan, and tremble, thou enemy of the faith, thou foe of the human race. For thou art the carrier of death and the robber of life. Thou art the shirker of justice and the root of all evil, the fomenter of vice, the seducer of men, the traitor of the nations, the instigator of envy, the font of avarice, the source of discord, the exciter of sorrows. More intense shit. Uh, The exorcist then makes the sign of the cross three times over, the brow of the possessed person. Should the victim resist, the assistant will step in to ensure they receive the blessing by holding them down. In the next part of the exorcism, the exorcist beseeches God to look upon his son or daughter who has fallen prey to Satan. A quick side note, each time the uh, pronoun of the victim is used, the original text indicates he or she. However, that's getting really clunky to read. So I'm just going to read it like a priest would for a male victim. And for demonstration's sake, we'll just make up a totally random name that I'm just going to pull out of thin air for our victim today. A name uh, I sure can't recall ever using before. How about we, uh, I don't know. How about we just go with uh, uh, Patrick L. Uh, Sajak. Let's say Patrick L. Sajak is possessed because he's been doing a bunch of nasty occult shit. Let's say he pretends to be some super wholesome dude, but really, <laughs> when no one's watching, when he's not in the public eye, 
He has kids in cages in the secret basement beneath his house. And when his wife and kids and grandkids aren't around, he heads downstairs and he fucks those kids. And he kills them. And he drinks their blood. And he does all that to please his lord and master, Satan. Let's just say all that about Patrick L. Sajak. And then one day, some co-worker of Patrick L. Sajak named, I don't know, whatever, Vanessa M. Whitey, notices that Patrick is for sure possessed by demons. And an exorcism has to be done. Now that this made-up scene has been set during this part of Patrick L. Sajak's exorcism, when the exorcist beseeches God to look upon his son or daughter who has fallen prey to Satan, the priest would recite this. O God, creator and defender of the human race, who hast formed man in thine image, look down with pity upon this, thy servant, Patrick Leonard Sajak, who we often call Pat, for he has fallen prey to the craftiness of an evil spirit. The ancient adversary, the arch enemy of the earth, enshrouds him in shuddering fear. He renders his mental mental faculties befuddled. He keeps him bewildered by making him so afraid. He holds him in a state of perturbation. Uh, Perturbation, yes. As he strikes terror within him. Drive out, O Lord, the power of the devil, and banish his artifices and frauds. Let him, the wicked tempter, be routed afar. By the sign of thy name. The exorcist makes the sign of the cross and the victim's uh, brow. Uh, Let thy servant be protected and safeguarded in both body and soul. Prayer goes on for a bit longer uh, with the exorcist tracing the sign of the cross over the possessed person's breast at three different times. In the next section, the exorcist again addresses the demon directly. It is also the longest passage he is instructed to recite without interruption. A portion of it reads, I adjure thee, thou ancient serpent, by the judge of the living and the dead, by thy own creator, by the creator of the world, by him who has the power to consign thee to hell that thou speedily depart in trembling along with thy raving followers from this servant of God, Patrick Leonard Sajak, whom we often call Pat, who has done terrible, unspeakable things to children, but now who seeks refuge in the bosom of the church. I adjure thee once more, not by my own weakness, but by the might of the Holy Spirit. Be gone from this servant of God, Patrick Leonard Sajak, (laughs) whom the Almighty has made in his image. Yield, therefore, yield, not to myself, but to the minister of Christ. For it is the power of Christ that compels thee. The exorcist then recites another prayer with the bystanders before continuing uh, to the last exorcism. I cast thee out, every unclean spirit, every phantom, every encroachment of Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ. For thee, O evil one, and for thy followers there will be worms which never perish. For thee and for thine angels is made already an unquenchable fire because thou art the prince of accursed murder. Thou the author of lechery. Thou the leader in sacrilege. Thou the model of vileness. Thou the teacher of heretics. Thou the inventor of every obscenity. Depart then, O evil one. Depart, accursed one. Depart with all thy falsity for God has desired that man be his temple. Be gone now. Be gone, thou seducer. Thy place is in solitude, thy dwelling in the serpent. Man thou canst betray, but God thou canst not mock. It is he that drives thee out, for whose eyes nothing is hidden. When the possessed person is fully liberated from the demon, the exorcist is encouraged but not required to repeat three prayers over the victim and the bystanders as many times as he deems necessary. The three prayers are the Our Father, the Hail Mary, and the Athanasian Creed. After that, he's instructed to recite in order Psalms 90, 67, 69, 53, 117, 34, 30, 21, 3, 10, and 12. A lot of stuff. Uh, Finally, the very last thing the exorcist says during the closing of the ritual is the prayer following deliverance. We beseech thee, O almighty God, that the spirit of inequity may no longer have any power over thy servant, Patrick Leonard Sajak, but rather that he may depart afar and nevermore return. At thy command, O Lord, let there enter into this man a disposition to goodness, finally, and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have been redeemed. And let us fear no evil, because the Lord is with us, who liveth and who reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit God for endless ages. And then everybody responds with, Amen. Okay, that was the 1614 exorcism rite. Uh, When the revised version of the ritual was released, I mean, condensed, obviously. When the the, uh, revised uh, version of the ritual was released in January of 1999. It caused uh, some controversy. In a 2002 edition of Latin Mass Magazine, one article, I haven't read it, surprisingly, one article uh, describes the new rite of exorcism as defective, laughable, scandalous, and dishonest. Some things that angered people the most about the new uh, revision 
was that 12 of the 21 steps in the preliminary instructions were removed. More emphasis placed on identifying the difference between mental illness and possession and consulting with medical professionals. And that much of the language was simplified to make the ritual easier to understand and more accessible. Many argue that because exorcism should only be performed by the select few, whether or not the ritual is easy to perform is irrelevant. In regards to this, part of that 2002 article reads, The preface of the new edition provides translation of the rite into myriad languages. But what on earth for? If an exorcist does not know enough Latin to perform the prayers in Latin, he should not be appointed to the office. Fucking boom! Yeah! Mic drop, what he said. Take that, Pope. Good folks at Latin Mass Magazine, not afraid to speak their minds. Now let's keep this uh, demon train. Moving down the hell tracks. And jump into our time suck timeline to investigate how the Catholic exorcism became what it is today. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. In ancient Mesopotamia, during the first millennium BC, Sumerian exorcists performed ceremonies to expel demons from the bodies of the innocent. Uh, While I think most of us link exorcism so strongly to Christianity, uh, specifically to the Catholic Church, yeah, they were happening prior to Christianity. Back then in Mesopotamia, which was largely made up of what is now Iraq, Kuwait, and Syria, magic was an integral part of the culture and an everyday reality for the people that lived there. When something unfortunate happened to you, uh, you you got sick, you had a broken arm, your crops failed, or your livestock started acting weird, that meant that a gosh dang demon had taken up residence in your body or on your land or in your, you know, pig or whatever. Or the demon might have been acting on its own free will, but it also could have been sent by a sorcerer, a warlock, right? And that pissed you off. Uh, although Mesopotamian exorcists occasionally were associated with a particular temple, they mostly just worked independently. It's private contractors, right? Had their own clients. Uh, during an exorcism, only the exorcist and the client could be present and the rituals lasted anywhere from a few hours to a couple of days. Through a series of incantations, the exorcist would call upon an element like oil or fire or an actual deity to aid them in their cause. Uh, The exorcism would end with the demon getting imprisoned within an inanimate object like a wooden figurine, which was then burned or thrown away. How many little demon boxes are now buried beneath the desert out there? Sounds like the start of a scared to death story. Uh, In the last couple centuries prior to the birth of Jesus, exorcisms show up in the Jewish faith, even one uh, of the 48 Jewish prophets, King Solomon born approximately 970 BC, reportedly performed multiple exorcisms. King Solomon, the demon slayer. A lot of demon talk around Solomon. Uh, The lesser key of Solomon I mentioned is based on the Testament of Solomon, uh, a book said to be written by King Solomon, son and successor of King David, the man who built the first temple in Jerusalem. And in the Testament of Solomon, Solomon battles so many demons. The book begins when a demon named uh, Ornias harasses a young man who is favored by Solomon. By stealing half of his pay and sucking out his vitality through the thumb on his right hand. That's crazy. Uh, Solomon prays the temple, receives from the archangel Michael a magic ring with the seal of God in the shape of a pentagram, interesting, which will enable him to command the demons. Solomon lends the ring to the lad who, by throwing the ring at the demon Ornias, stamps him with the seal and brings him under control. Then Solomon orders the demon or- uh, Ornias to take the ring and similarly imprint the prince of demons, Beelzebul. With Beelzebub, not spelled Beelzebub in this book, under his command, Solomon now has all the demons at his bidding to build the temple. And Beelzebub reveals that he was formerly the highest ranking angel in heaven. And a bunch of demon shit happens in this book. A lot, lot of exorcisms. A man named Flavius would also write about Solomon and his demon fighting ways about a thousand years later. In 94 AD, Jerusalem-born Flavius Josephus uh, wrote a 20-volume work that describes the history of the Jewish people from the creation of Adam and Eve as it is described in the Hebrew Bible all the way through the first Jewish-Roman War in 66 AD. The massive work is called The Antiquities of the Jews and contains multiple references to the gifts of exorcism that God gave Solomon, as well as how the tactics used by Solomon to evict evil spirits were still being used in his own day. Uh, Quote, This method of cure is of great force unto this day, for I have seen a certain man of my own country releasing people that were demonical in the presence of Vespasian, and his sons, and his captains, and the whole multitude of his soldiers. In approximately 670 BC, a Babylonian, or possibly a Syrian king, calls upon an exorcist to expel evil demons troubling him. On the king's estate, the exorcist uh, performs a ritual which translates to the burning. 
The burning was one of the most common forms of exorcism during this time. And this particular case is uh, that we have is, is, or excuse me, this particular case is one where we have the most detailed report of it. Uh, the ritual began at dusk, lasted until dawn. During it, the exorcist recited over a hundred incantations, placed magical items around the victim's room and anointed him with oil. So definitely some similarities between, uh, you know, this type of exorcism and ones that will come later within Christianity. Uh, we can ascertain more of what the exorcist did during the ritual because we still have the instruction manual for it. The directions for the burning were inscribed on a series of nine tablets. Eight of the tablets are inscribed with the full incantations for the exorcist to recite during the ritual. The ninth is inscribed with the accompanying actions. Small fragments or simplified versions of the burning ritual were found both in the royal libraries from the uh, period as well as in private libraries of known exorcists, such as a medicine man named uh, Kassir Asur. Interestingly enough, Kassir Asur, uh, not only one of the earliest exorcists we know of, but one of the earliest healers in recorded human history. According to the Corpus of Mesopotamian Anti-Witchcraft Rituals by the University of Würzburg in Germany, the basic structure of the burning is fairly similar to that of most exorcisms. During the ceremony, quote, the victim is transferred from a state of imminent death back to life. He is purified and his bound state undone. Sorcerer and sorceress are assigned the fate they had intended for their victim by sending the witchcraft back to them. Oh, shit. You just got reverse cursed. Uh, during the third century BC, exorcisms directed at demons that cause disease and illness are taught by the Jewish faith. A set of ancient manuscripts called the Dead Sea Scrolls from this period outline how one can uh, charm a demon out of a victim's body using incantations and songs. And uh, some of these songs have been translated into English and performed uh, with full musical accompaniment. Pretty cool. Uh, you can find the videos on YouTube. Uh, here's uh, one of many. Incredible! Michael motherfucking McDonald! Demon Slayer! Uh, additionally, passages in the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, describe how those who have fallen under the influence of false prophets or mediums also required an exorcism. Uh, sometime between 6 and 4 BCE, not in year zero. Actually, there was no year zero. Uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem to Mary and Joseph. The calendar moves from 1 BCE to 1 AD, by the way. Uh, and in approximately 28 AD, Jesus and Baphomet mud wrestle. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. At the Bethlehem Civic Center and Auditorium on University Street, across from the Holiday Inn Express and KFC, the Son of God takes on one of hell's mightiest demons. Two deities enter the cage. Only one will survive. Jesus is the betting favorite since he's the son of Almighty God and also God himself. It's complicated, but Baphomet is pretty scary looking with goat head and wings. Will fear be a factor or will faith prevail? We'll sell you the whole seat, but you only need the edge. Uh, for real now, 28 AD, Jesus is baptized in the River Jordan at Bethany by John the Baptist. Immediately afterwards, he departs for the Judean desert for 40 days and 40 nights with no food or water. Uh, during his fast, head demon, Satan, tries to tempt Jesus away from God three times, and each time, Satan fails. <laughs> Suck my dick, Satan! Uh, when he returns from the desert, Jesus brings teaching and performing miracles. One of these miracles being exorcisms. He does this until his crucif crucifixion in 30 AD. In Mark 1, uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 23 through 26, a man with an unclean spirit entered the synagogue, screaming and shouting at Jesus. According to the King James Version of the Bible, Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. In another instance, described in Mark, uh, chapter 5, verses 8 through 13, Jesus is met by a naked and wild man with superhuman strength living amongst the tombs uh, of Gadarene. I wonder if that dude had a boner. Come on, am I the only one? Anyone else that wonder that? I mean, kind of an important detail. It's never made clear in scripture, which is unfortunate because this fucker, uh, you know, he's scary either way, but way more scary if he's got a boner. And how big is it? Six inches? That's a little bit scary. 10 inches, thick as a baby's arm. That is terrifying. Two inches, not much bigger around than a soda straw. Pretty funny, actually. Uh, it's clear that not only is the man possessed, but he'd been possessed for a long, long time. During their encounter, after proclaiming uh, 
Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Jesus speaks directly to the demon and asks its name. Though the possessed, uh, through the possessed man, the entity responds, my name is Legion, for we are many. That's a badass quote. It's one of the spookiest quotes, to me at least, in the whole Bible. Uh, for context, a Roman legion consists of 6,000 men. So although there might not have been exactly 6,000 demons, uh, excuse me, possessing the man's body, it was clear you know, that there were a lot. He was infested. You know how they say the human body is mostly water? This dude, you know, mostly demon. In the face of the Son of God, the legion of demons begs Jesus not to send them out of the area, but to send them out of the man and allow them to enter uh, the bodies of a herd of pigs nearby. Not sure why. They would beg him for that. It's never made entirely clear to me, at least. Uh, Jesus obliges and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. Sounds like, although there were a lot of demons, none of them were real smart. That was a legion of dummy demons. I hope if I ever have to do battle with a demon or demons, they're dumb as fuck, right? Give up, Daniel. God will not save you. Resistance is futile. Your soul is mine. I don't know, Damon. I don't think you're strong enough to take me. I bet you're so weak. You couldn't even possess this tiny little ant here on the counter. You don't think I'm strong enough to possess an ant, you fool. No, I don't. I mean, I mean, if you could, if you could possess that little ant, I'll just give you my soul. Watch me, fool. And then I look down at the counter and the little ant's head starts to spin around and then just bam, just fucking squish it. Fuck you, dumbass ant demon. It'll be a nice demon battle. For me, uh, by the third century AD, Christianity is spreading rapidly across uh, the world. The purpose of exorcism, well, it's not, not the world, the, the area, the known world for the people living there in the Middle East, a little bit of Europe, uh, becomes solidified within the church. The success of Christianity relied heavily on the admonishment of paganism, aka any belief system that is not Christianity. In such, during this period, paganism starts to be seen as something evil, something that requires exorcisms. For the first time in the 4th century AD, minor exorcisms become an integral part of the rite of baptism, or a minor exorcism. Uh, Going to jump way ahead now. Uh, during the Middle Ages, approximately around the 12th century, 13th century AD, the rite of exorcism becomes more widely available through the publication of pontificals, small portable collections of ceremonies a priest can perform. However, unlike the ritual Romanum, uh, which standardized the ceremonies in 1614, Pontificals were produced by individual monasteries or cathedrals and thus each had slight variations. During this period, Christian scholars start to study demonology, which helps legitimize the practice of exorcism. For example, in his Summa Theologia, uh, written in the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas writes, Demons cannot work miracles, nor can any creature, but God alone, since in the strict sense a miracle is something done outside the order of the entire craft created nature, under which order every power of a creature is contained but sometimes miracle may be taken in a wide sense for whatever exceeds the human power and experience and thus demons can work miracles that is things which rouse man's astonishment by reason of their being beyond his power and outside his sphere of knowledge because more people now had access to the instructions for expelling satan it is also during this period that a form of exorcism starts being used to summon satan most famous example of an exorcism used for paganism takes place in the 1400s as written about in the Book of Incantations, Exorcisms, and Various Fascinations. The only surviving copy of this book is housed in the Bavarian State Library in Munich, Germany, and it's uh, thus uh, most often called the Munich Manual of Demonic Magic. The Munich Manual is what is known as a grimoire, textbook of magic, and this particular grimoire teaches a type of European sorcery called Goetia. And random side note, when I looked on YouTube for a video on how to pronounce Goetia, the first video that came up was posted by none other than recent suck subject, Damien Eccles. One of the West Memphis Three, I thought that was pretty cool, really caught me off guard. Uh, very intelligent, well-read, well-spoken dude, by the way. Posts about all kinds of esoteric, interesting shit. He has a Patreon YouTube channel dedicated to magic, M-A-G-I-C-K. Uh, very knowledgeable about stuff like the Lesser Key of Solomon, uh, Wiccan Beliefs, uh, Thelema, and more. Anyway, the Munich Manual contains instructions on how to cast spells for your every need including, but not limited to, seeing the future, finding a lost item, becoming invisible, resurrecting a dead person, necromancy, uh, arousing hatred between friends, obtaining a horse, obt <laughs> obtaining a boat, obtaining a castle, obtaining a throne, obtaining a woman's love, or one of my favorites, for obtaining information about theft by gazing into a fingernail. Ah, yeah, totally. Look at a fingernail long enough. And I guess you'll start to think, uh, you know, you've learned all sorts of shit. Probably because you're completely out of your mind. 
Uh, also, I like the range of power regarding these spells, right? Do you want to spend a bunch of time figuring out how to get a spell to work uh, regarding obtaining a horse? Or do you want to learn how to raise the dead? The manual also offers a directory of various demons and their individual specialties, as well as how to conjure each of them. And these demonic conjuring rituals use the exact same language as that of the Catholic exorcism. Uh, the ritual for calling Satan forth, for example, is almost identical to the rite of exorcism. Interestingly enough, this is because both rituals are centered around the exorcist or conjurer invoking the power of God to force the devil into submission. For example, uh, a section of the rite of uh, conjuring Satan reads, O oh, you demons and all princes and every kind of demon, whom your guilt cast out from heaven on high, I adjure you and order you to obey my command and my precepts. Just as God commanded the Jordan, and it stood still that the children of Israel might walk across without hindrance. So too I command you to obey my precepts day and night, at all hours and moments, and be subject to my precepts. So by invocation of our Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to obey me without delay, without harm or deception to me. Uh, if possible, would be pretty cool to be able to conjure and control the devil. Right, have a bunch of friends over for a party. We all just sit around, uh, just make the devil entertain you. Satan, <laughs> Satan, I command thee to break dance for two straight minutes. Go now, Satan, Satan. Now I command thee to do an impression of Christopher Walken singing Miley Cyrus's flowers. Do it now, devil. Uh, all right, jumping forward to June 17, 1614. When Pope Paul V authorizes the publication of the first edition of the Rituale Romanum. As we know, it was the first time the Vatican put forth a single uniform text on how to perform a, all liturgical related ceremonies and rituals, including the rite of exorcism. Uh, in 1704, the Vatican forbids the use of any text except the official rite of exorcism to perform the ritual. This includes all the work done by revered exorcists from the previous three centuries, including a Franciscan friar named Giolamo. Mengi. Uh, Mengi, who died in 1609, had contributed heavily to both the church's understanding of exorcism and the scholarly pursuit of demonology. His most famous work on exorcism was the Flagellum Demonum, the Devil's Scourge, in 1576, which emphasized the profundity of the battle between good and evil and the fact that anyone, including holy persons, could become possessed. In his work, Mengi also drew heavily from European folkloric and magical traditions of the demonic and incorporated them into his Christian convictions. Mengi's texts, as well as many others written by renowned exorcists, would end up added to the Vatican's index of prohibited books. Uh, however, in more remote areas of the colonized New World that Catholic missionaries were working in, the official rite was largely ignored. Instead, the beliefs of the indigenous people and slaves of the areas uh, merged with the Mengi-style exorcisms. Uh, I've talked about this on Scared to Death, but not here, but I'm intrigued by how religions old and new and cultures all around the world, from the present day going back to the beginning of the written, you know, word. And I have to imagine long before that had their boogeyman, right? Their demons, their monsters, their jinn and devils. It makes the mystical side of me think, what if? What if, you know, these beliefs, you know, all are possibly at least somewhat based in something real. And, and I know there are plenty of explanations for these, you know, commonalities outside of the supernatural. But what if that innate fear of the other, fear of the boogeyman, of demons, of a danger lying just beyond our home or town, past the edge of the woods in the dark forest, what if it's not just based in our imaginations and primal fear of the unknown because real things from the unknown would show up and kill us quite often in ancient times? What if it's based at least partially in some spooky supernatural shit? Uh, 1949, the demonic possession of a 13-year-old boy sparks a new era of fascination uh, with exorcisms in secular America. Although the story made national headlines, the true identity of the boy was concealed and he is only ever referred to by the pseudonyms of Robert Mannheim or Roland Doe. Uh, I told the story in a different way than I'll present the info here back in the fourth episode of Scared to Death, Making New Friends. The iconic 1973 horror film, The Exorcist, inspired by the 1971 book of the same name, uh, that book inspired by this case of alleged demonic possession. Uh, while I won't give this abbreviated telling the full scared to death treatment, you'll have to go over there for that. Uh, bringing back some of that creepy music from before is going to make it more entertaining. Growing up as an only child in the quiet town of Cottage City, Maryland, Robbie was a little bit of a loner. 
His favorite person to hang out with was his Aunt Harriet. Unlike his Lutheran parents, Robbie's aunt was a practicing spiritualist. She devoted a good deal of her time to communicating with the other side and shared all she knew about Ouija boards and seances with her curious nephew. Robbie was immediately hooked. He and his aunt would spend hours dabbling in the occult. And then roughly a year after all this dabbling began, Robbie's aunt Harriet dies in early January of 1949 due to what has possibly cryptically been described as natural causes. Very soon after her death, demonic activity begins. Robbie's home was infested with the sounds of liquid dripping from the ceiling, scratching from inside the walls and against the floorboards, and heavy footsteps when no one was around to make them. Furniture moved in his presence. His bed was seen levitating while he slept in it by multiple witnesses. And at school, additional, multiple witnesses, classmates, watched his desk jolt and shake into the aisle without his feet ever touching the ground. All the while, Robbie continued to mess around with his Ouija board. He'd become obsessed with trying to contact his dead aunt. He also began to grow morose and withdrawn, and soon his family sought help. After psychiatry proved unsuccessful in curing Robbie of his new condition, the family turned to Reverend Luther Schultz, the 43-year-old pastor of the St. Stephen's Evangelical Lutheran Church. They, was part of, they were part of his congregation in Maryland. While visiting their home, Schultz later will claim he witnessed numerous untouched objects move in Robbie's presence. And he started organizing prayer circles around the boy, hoping the power of prayer would be enough to dispel whatever ills were afflicting him. However, he did not know how to perform an exorcism. The Lutheran faith does not validate the concept of a type of demonic possession that would require an exorcism, and therefore they have no ritual or guidelines regarding how to confront it. At first, Schultz believed Robbie was somehow manufacturing the phenomena himself. In attempting to catch him, he suggested Robbie spend a night at his house. That way, the boy wouldn't be able to perform any of the tricks that he did in his own home. On February 17, 1949, Robbie and Scholz each tucked themselves in to one of the twin four-poster beds sitting parallel to each other in the master bedroom. Throughout the night, the minister, who stayed awake, witnessed Robbie's bed shake and the armchair he then sat in after leaving his bed move as though it was being dragged. Dazed and frightened, the minister decided that the safest place for Robbie to sleep was the floor. But at 3 a.m., Schultz witnessed Robbie in the blanket he was sleeping with slide as a single unit from the foot of the twin bed to underneath it. Terrified, Schultz stooped over the side of his bed and saw Robbie laying completely flat on his back and seemingly in a trance, bouncing up and down harshly against the hardwood floor and the exposed springs at the bottom of the mattress. Robbie did not flinch as his face was cut, sliced over and over by sharp metal. The next morning, Scholes returned Robbie home defeated. As Robbie's parents remembered it, the last thing the minister said to them was, you have to see a Catholic priest. The Catholics know about things like this. On February 26th, thin wounds like cat scratches began spontaneously appearing on Robbie's arms, legs, and chest. Desperate, the Mannheims, greatly worried about the health and well-being of their child, took Scholes' advice and sought a Catholic priest out. They found Father Albert Hughes at the nearby St. James Church. Like the minister before him, what Hughes saw terrified him to the core. He even claimed Robbie spoke to him in Latin, a language he did not know, claiming to be the devil. Although he was not an ordained exorcist, after informing the archdiocese of the situation, Hughes was granted permission to perform an emergency exorcism on Robbie. All the while, Robbie's condition was worsening exponentially. From February 28th through March 2nd, Robbie was hospitalized at the Jesuit-run Georgetown University Georgetown Medical School Complex in Washington, and there he underwent his first exorcism. To protect his privacy, Robbie was admitted under a false name. To protect everyone around him, he was strapped down to his hospital bed. Attending nurses and physicians, so many witnesses, reported Robbie speaking in tongues, tools and trays flying across the room, furniture moving, and in one instance, Robbie even demanded a doctor remove a cross necklace that was hidden under his surgical gown. When Hughes began speaking the first prayer of exorcism, Robbie tactfully slid his hand from the leather restraints, removed a piece of loose mattress spring, and slashed the priest's arm from shoulder to wrist. Hughes ended the exorcism there and went into hiding. Reportedly, he went on to suffer a complete mental breakdown. 
Back at home, the family now discussed seeking help in St. Louis, where they both had relatives. That night, the word Louis appeared brutally scratched onto Robbie's chest. Apparently, with the demon on board, the family packed their things and headed for Missouri. In Missouri, the Mannheim stayed with another one of Robbie's aunts and her and his uncle's house with her older cousin, Elizabeth. Ru- worried for her cousin, Elizabeth sought the help of one of her professors, Father Raymond Bishop. After much deliberation and consulting with higher-ups, Bishop decided to go visit the boy. On Wednesday, March 9th, he arrived at the house to observe Robbie and offer blessings. From what he saw there, Bishop concluded Robbie was suffering from demonic obsession, not possession. However, he later retracted that claim. After seeing Robbie lay perfectly still while his mattress hovered in the air, moving ever so slightly from side to side. On March 10th, Bishop sought the help of a close friend and fellow priest, Father William Bodern. Three days later, the two priests returned to Robbie's house to speak with his family. While speaking with the boy's parents, aunt, uncle, and cousin in the living room, they were interrupted by a sudden burst of agonizing screams coming from upstairs. They found Robbie in his room, looking terrified, yet scratches covering both his forearms. On Wednesday, March 16th, Father Bowden receives permission to perform the rite of exorcism over Robbie. With the assistance of Father Bishop and 26-year-old Walter Holleran, who has not yet been made an who is who was not yet an ordained priest, but practicing to become one, they began the ritual that evening. By the way, Father Bishop, what a confusing name for a priest. Makes you wonder if there are uh, any Father Popes out there. Anyway, uh, here are a few excerpts from notes made by Bowdoin during the exorcism. In them, he uses R to refer to as Robbie. Uh, From Wednesday, March 16th, he says, Marks were made in the boy's body more than 25 different times during the course of the evening, each mark causing the boy to double up with pain. Uh, Friday, March 18th, he wrote, The prayers of the exorcism were continued, and R, Robbie, was seized violently so that he began to struggle with his pillow and the bed clothing. The arms, legs, and head of R had to be held by three men. The contortions revealed physical strength beyond the natural power of R. He spit at the relics and at the priest's hands. He writhed under the sprinkling of holy water. He fought and screamed in a diabolical high-pitched voice. He stood up in bed and fought all those around him. He shouted, jumped, swung his fists. His face was devilish. He snapped his teeth in fury. He snapped at the priest's hand in the blessings. He bit those who held him. Then on Saturday, March 19th, R went to bed at 8 p.m. and the routine of the exorcism was begun again. Violent shouting with fiendish laughter were a part of the phenomena. The shouting resembled the barking of a dog and the snapping of R's teeth was truly diabolical. Uh, It should be stated again that the violent reactions always followed upon the prayers of the exorcism. There had been no violence from from the boy before the exorcism was begun on the night of March 16th. On March 21st, increasingly ill and violent, Ravi was taken to the nearby Alexian Brothers Hospital, where he was locked in a room with no interior doorknob and bars on the windows. Robbie returned to his uncle's house the next day, but only stayed there for one night. Bodern had arranged for Robbie to have a room in his church's rectory, where the priest himself lived. On March 23rd, Robbie was brought to his room in the rectory, which had two beds so that his dad could stay with him. That evening, the exorcism resumed. This time, Bodern, Bishop Halloran, and, Va- and Robbie's dad were joined by Father William Van Rue. So many would have a hand in these exorcism rituals. As part of his post-ordination uh, tertianship, Van Roo had just been assigned to Bodern as a general assistant. Apparently, Bodern greeted the newcomer just a few days earlier by telling him, Bill, I've got just a project for you. When the exorcist started reading the litany of saints, Robbie immediately began to kick, scream, and spit. It took Bishop, Halloran, Van Roo, and Robbie's dad, who was reluctant to do so, all holding him down to keep Robbie from hurting himself. At one point, Robbie abruptly stopped his tantrum, looked wide-eyed at Halloran with a gentle smile, and softly he asked, Please let go of my arms. You're hurting me. Halloran refused and Robbie shut his eyes and immediately returned to violently thrashing and shrieking. Halloran held on tighter. Van Roo then said to him, "This, there is no sense in having to hold his arms that hard. You're only making him uncomfortable. Although Halloran disagreed, uh, as he had seen the demon set similar traps before because Van Roo was a priest and therefore his superior, he let go of Robbie's arm and in a split second with his eyes still closed, Robbie slammed his small fist directly upwards into Halloran's nose, then struck Van Roo precisely in the middle of his face. Although the priest knows only bled, Halloran's was broken. Uh, When Bodern began to say, I command thee, unclean spirit, Robbie started urinating, laughing in a low demonic howl, and a stench filled the room that was so vile, it nearly caused the men present to vomit. Amidst his diabolical cackles, Robbie then began to shout, I am in hell, I am in hell. 
While sitting straight up in the bed, Robbie then slowly turned his head to face Bodern. His eyes were still closed. A massive grin plastered across his face. He said to the exorcist, I am in hell. I see you. I see you. You're in hell. It's 1957. Agonized and scared, the father paused. This is the first time that Bowden reacted in any way to the things the demon said or did. Something terrible, terrible. Clearly it happened to him in 1957. He didn't want to think or talk about it. Something he knew Robbie shouldn't have been able to know. Uh, Robbie was also recorded as saying and or writing the following during his exorcisms. Uh, you, addressing the priests, have big pricks and you like to rub them up and down. Dead bishop, Robert will suffer forever. I am the devil himself. Go to hell, you sons of bitches. God damn you, sons of bitches. Stick it up your ass, referencing the crucifix. And you will die tonight. You will die tonight. You will die tonight. Uh, although some progress had been made in vexing the demon, it was decided by the exorcism team that Robbie would have a better chance of being liberated if he, if he converted to Catholicism. Robbie's parents had previously been planning for him to get confirmed in their Lutheran church, but told their son religion was his own choice. He chose to convert. April 1st, 1949, Robbie, Robbie was baptized, but not without a fight. As soon as he was placed in the car that would take him to the church, he immediately became violent and hostile, even going so far as yanking on the steering wheel after wriggling free from his dad's grasp. Excuse me, the actual baptism took a very long time because Robbie repeatedly fell into seizures and trances where he would spout the same insults and blasphemy that he uh, had been doing for the last couple months. One particularly difficult roadblock was when the priest asked, does thou renounce Satan? And the boy launched into another violent rampage. Eventually, Robbie was lucid for uh, enough small increments of time to answer questions required of him and was officially baptized. Next day, April 2nd, Robbie makes his first Holy Communion with just as much struggle. The exorcism lasted another 16 days, during which Robbie continued to exhibit unnatural strength during his violent outbursts, such as scratching, biting, kicking, and punching, slapping, throwing glass items at people's heads. Words continued to appear on his skin as if burned or carved into his skin. In moments of lucidity, Robbie also complained about the men down there, how they harassed him, as well as the unbearable pain he felt all over his body, particularly, particularly in his penis. During this period, the threats made by the demon became more alarming. By April 17th, he was no longer simply promising that those around him would all end up in hell. He was now threatening to send them there by killing them with a knife. Many sources guess the demon uh, increased the severity of his threats out of desperation. Although Ravi was still being tormented, it was clear that the demon's hold on the boy was weakening. The exorcism team started identifying signs of deliverance, such as being able to recite more of his prayers without succumbing to a fit of violence or agony, and his physical health occasionally in short increments, returning to a semi-normal state. Robbie started to ask for things like water and food to call his mom that he missed. On April 18th, Robbie asked to borrow a Catholic book of poetry, the kind that three months prior, you know, would have immediately destroyed or desecrated. Instead, as Bodern describes, R thumbed through several stories as he sat in bed. Finally, in a boyish way, he took to balancing the book on his knees and on his head. Unfortunately, the spell of normalcy was then broken. While attempting to balance the book on his head, his eyes suddenly shut and he went completely stiff. The book then flew violently across the room without his arms touching it and thumped against the wall. Robbie again went into a fit of seizures. That evening, Bowden resolved to try something new. Instead of speaking in his usual authoritative voice, he took on a quiet, stern tone while performing the exorcism. Throughout the night, Robbie's violent outbursts and freakish feats of strength, his vulgar tirades and the wounds that appeared all over his body, the supernatural movement of inanimate objects around the room, and the murderous, prophecy he's, murderous prophecies he declared, all were as profound and dire as they'd ever been. But this time, whenever he came to, Robbie did weakly attempt to pray the rosary. Throughout the rite, the exorcist maintained he uh, is, maintained he composed, you know, his composed tone of voice, excuse me, while Robbie wailed and screamed in agony, his body contorting in unnatural ways. When Bodern spoke the last amen of the ritual, dead silence enveloped the room. At that moment, a powerful, distinct voice reportedly erupted from Robbie, who was lying limp on the bed. And the voice said, Satan, Satan, I am Saint Michael and I command you, Satan, and the other, and the other evil spirits to leave the body in the name of Dominus immediately. Now, now, now. What followed was what Bodern described as, quote, the most violent contortions of the entire period of exorcism. Then, after this big, demonic crescendo it was over the exorcism was complete and the demon was sent back to hell right intense shit right i mean if true imagine how seeing all that might change your perspective on the nature of the universe or you know strongly reconfirm what you already believe august 20th 1949 the washington post publishes an article titled priest frees mount rainier boy reportedly held in devil's grip by journalist bill brinkley despite the priest's attempt 
to keep the case under wraps, news quickly got out about Robbie's miraculous possession and headlines like this splattered on front pages across the country. Uh, it was uh, this particular article that William Peter Blatty read as a student at Georgetown University and later it would inspire him to write The Exorcist. Also, I should note here, there have been plenty of skeptics who think this is all bullshit, right? That the kid faked it all, that William Peter Blatty embellished a lot of details about us, that some of the priests lied, you know, on and on and on. Who knows? It's, it's a he said, she said, maybe a demon said. 1971, William Peter Blatty publishes The Exorcist. He based it on Robbie's exorcism, but changed the gender of the possessed kid to a little girl. Uh, upon release, the book was massively controversial as well as super successful. Spent 57 weeks on the New York Times bestsellers list, 17 of which it was consecutively at number one. There's good money and well-told demon tales. 1973, The Exorcist, directed by William Friedkin, hits theaters. Like the book it was based on, the movie sparks both outrage and adoration from viewers across the world. Although most churchgoers that were uh, outspoken about the film detested it, there were a few members of the clergy that praised and or promoted the movie because of the way it spoke to the fight between good and evil, as well as the urgency of the fight. According to a 2012 interview with Friedkin, after the movie was released, he received multiple calls from higher ups in the church accrediting the film for a spike in priest and nun applicants. That's wild. Uh, two clergymen who were not big fans of it, however, were Father Bodern and Father Halloran, who saw the movie in theaters. According to Halloran, uh, I don't know exactly how to pronounce his name, his fellow exorcist did tell him on the way out, however, there is a good message that can be given by this thing. That evil still, that evil spirits operate in our world. Jump into 1986 now. Father Russell Crowe, I mean, Father Gabriele Amorth, is appointed to the office of exorcist in the Diocese of Rome by the Pope's vicar, Cardinal Ugo Paleri Maserati, Gnocchi, Enchilada, Spaghetti, Tostada, Antonio Banderas. Sorry, sometimes I mix up my languages now. It's, it's confusing to be so perfectly trilingual. Uh, his name was Cardinal Ugo Poletti. Amorth claimed to have performed between 70,000 and 160,000 exorcisms during his career in the Vatican. If you're bumping on that number, yeah, me too. However, only 100 of these were cases of genuine possession, he said, that required a major exorcism. Right? A lot of the rest is like a minute here, a minute there. He comments on this ratio in his book, and Exorcist tells his story. Quoting famous French exorcist, Father Tonkadec, who said, There are a vast number of unhappy souls who, while not showing signs of demonic possession, turn to the exorcist to be relieved of their sufferings, such as stubborn illnesses, adversities, all sorts of misfortunes. Those possessed by the devil are few, but these unhappy souls are legion. I like that quote. Sad, but profound. Uh, the exorcist was fervently outspoken about the devil and the danger he possesses, which both benefited the church as it legitimized their practices. If the devil's real, that means so is God. But he also caused quite a few controversies in his time. For example, in 1986, Amorth commented on a statistic that 80% of the exorcisms performed in Rome each week were on women, saying that was because women are, quote, more vulnerable because they are the ones who mostly go to see clairvoyants, mediums, card readers, attend seances, and belong to satanic sects. It could be that the devil wants to use them to get at men like Eve did to Adam. That's it. I have to submit my wife, Lindsay, before a crystal bullshit infests our entire house with demons. I'm probably gonna have to tie her to the bed when I get home. Probably naked. You know, I might need to get naked as, naked as well. And then, you know, when it comes to the exorcism ritual, I'll, I'll probably just wing it. You know, maybe draw a cross on my, on my penis and see how she responds to that. Then wash it off. Draw a pentagram on my wiener. See how she responds to that. Uh, I'll stop. Uh, 1994. The International Association of Exorcists is established in Rome by six priests, including Father Amorth. The exorcists had stated, uh, had started, excuse me, meeting unofficially in the early uh, 1980s, didn't formalize their association until 94. January 26, 1999, with the approval of Pope John Paul II, the Vatican Congregation for Divine Worship publishes an updated version of the rite of exorcism called, what I said earlier, De Exorcisme, De Exorcisme, Exorcismis. It's a sub supplicationibus quizbustam of exorcisms and certain supplications. Uh, the new edition created a stronger link between baptism and exorcism and placed more emphasis on the need for a proper medical examination before one gets authorized to receive an exorcism. June 13th, 2014, the Holy See officially recognizes the International Association of Exorcists as a private association of the church. The organization currently has a public website, uh, AIEI, or excuse me, AIE, international.org where you can read about their history their mission statement 
recent testimonies from exorcists and persons who have been possessed, as well as purchase books they've published and even keep up with latest news. Uh, at the time this episode was being written, one of the most recent articles on the site was titled, Hell Has Never Been As Accessible As It Is Today, written by a 20-year-old Tuscan girl. In it, the anonymous girl writes about how the insidious environment adolescents grow up in today and the bounds the prince of evil is weaving between his kingdom and the young souls are pretty scary. Uh, September 25th through September 30th, 2023, the 14th International Conference of the International Association of Exorcists uh, took place near Rome, Roma. According to the press release, 203 exorcists and 100 assistants attended from all uh, around the world. Some of the topics presented during the conference were whether or not it is biblically permissible for non-exorcists to command demons, the important uh, importance of collaboration with doctors for discerning between possession and mental illness, and the overlap between the Ministry of Exorcism and anti-cult efforts. Finally, jumping up to today, according to many church sources in 2024, demonic possession and demand for exorcism is on the rise. The increase has been growing steadily for the last two decades, prompting a response on multiple occasions from Pope Francis. While the church is ordaining more and more exorcists to combat the devil and his demons, they don't do this because they think they can stop demonic possession. They just want to help more people who they believe suffer from it. As one priest told Vatican News, the fight against the evil one started at the origin of the world and is destined to last until the end of the world. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Uh, before I share some final thoughts, uh, I have a sponsor I need to squeeze in here real quick. Another one. Uh, if you want to skip ahead, just do. This sponsor sucks. Uh, he paid us you know, quite a bit of money, which is odd because he seems like he needs quite a bit of money. And uh, that's why he got this commercial. But it, it sucks. Not, not a good way. And I, and I certainly would never, ever hire him. <sighs> Hello. Um, Gregory Rhodes. Uh, huh. Most folks call me Sleepy Greg. Uh, I'm offering up my my, my services oh, for overnight home or business personal security. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, for around thirty bucks a night, if, if you got it, I'll I'll sleep. I'll I'll sit in your car, in your driveway, or otherwise nearby. And uh, oh my gosh, no one makes sure no messing with your stuff. So hire me, and don't look don't look at my business reviews. A lot of angry people who thought I was, oh, I was getting paid to do nothing but sleep. That's not true. That's how I make uh, bad guys uh, think they can get away with stuff. I look at that like I'm asleep. But I'm not. I see everything. If you have to shake me for a while to get me to look like I wake up, uh, uh, that's just method acting. So call me. Uh, call Sleepy Greg. Hire me. Give me 30 bucks if you got it. Give me 30 bucks. Sleepy Greg. I'm not going to fall asleep on the job. Uh, I'm just going to look like it. Give me. God, that was easily the worst commercial we fucking ever had. And we've had some bad ones. He didn't even leave a business name or phone number or website. Ugh. Fucking sleepy Greg. Uh, back to demons now. So there you have it, Meat Sacks. How to get rid of demons. Uh, again, I will say that the existence of demons, you know, has obviously never been proven scientifically. No one's recorded in a laboratory, you know, setting. Uh, like, you know, there's no way... Uh, this film could have been doctored kind of way. Somebody's limbs contorting unnaturally or somebody levitating or someone suddenly being able to, to read the minds and memory banks of the people around them or possess superhuman strength and suddenly fluently speak several languages that never been spoken before. Uh, but also so many people have claimed to see so much crazy shit in this regard. I say this all the time. I'm scared to death. Uh, are all of them lying or hallucinating or misremembering? Imagining every single one in all of human history, all we need to believe in the existence of something paranormal in this space is for just one single story to be true. Just one person to have ever been possessed by a sentient entity that doesn't actually have a physical body, at least not in this plane of existence. I personally hope demons are real. I really do. And I know that's some weird shit to say, but I do hope so. The world is already pretty damn interesting. It's already amazing. But with demons, now it's magical. If demons are real, you know, what else is real? Angelic beings? Who the fuck knows? I'm not going to go full Chad Daybell. <laughs> These thoughts create some kind of demon zombie lightworker scale. 
I just want to believe that something magical is out there. Something that will make every horror movie you watch a little scarier and every death of a loved one a little less sad because you know there's truly a good chance that their consciousness could live on because now anything's possible. At the very least, pretty fascinating to think about how many people claim to have witnessed something demonic or have been afflicted or possessed. Interesting to think about people like Father Amorth who have dedicated most of their lives to literally battling demons. Father Amorth died in Rome at the age of 91 in 2016 and... uh He was either a con man, easily deluded, mentally ill, or a guy who occasionally actually exercised demons. Uh, He did once explain to an interviewer that he would never perform an exorcism based solely on someone's claims of possession, that he always directed people to psychiatrists and doctors first. So that's pretty cool. I mean, he also said that reading Harry Potter literally leads one into evil, which is weird. Uh, I could speculate about all this for another hour and still not arrive at a concrete answer. With stuff like this, I'll have to see it, you know, to truly believe it. And if I do see it, uh, man, I hope I'm not the one possessed. Or, or there's not, you know, somebody in my family. If, if you get possessed, that might be pretty, pretty cool. If you Listen, go get possessed. Shoot me an email. And I'll try and make it to your exorcism. I'll, I'll be in your prayer party, right? I'll, I'll be there to watch. Deal? Okay, cool. Thanks. Let's head to today's takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one. There are two forms of exorcism in the Catholic Church, major and minor. Minor exorcisms are used regularly to ward off or weaken demonic influence in a person's life. Major exorcisms, extremely rare, only used in cases of proven demonic possession, at least proven in the eyes of the clergy. Only an ordained exorcist is permitted to perform a major exorcism. Number two, the Catholic Church says that there are four main reasons that people get possessed slash become victims of extraordinary satanic activity. One, God is allowing them to uh, just as he uh, allows, you know, ordinary satanic activity. Uh, They have been cursed by a sorcerer. Two, three, they've been uh, fucking around with satanic things like Ouija boards, yoga, crystals, tarot. And four, they sold their soul to Satan. Um, Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, I I think I messed up a word in number one. God is allowing them to, you know, become victims just as he allows ordinary satanic activity. Uh, I just want to make that clear. Number three, Uh, The first official instructions for the rite of exorcism were published by the church way back in 1614. The ritual went unchanged until 1999 when it was completely revised by the Vatican. The new version of the ritual, shorter than the first, places more emphasis on identifying the difference between uh, demonic activity and mental illness and now includes an appendix of exorcism prayers in the back for members of the faithful to use in the privacy of their own homes and lives. Number four, exorcism has been around a long time. Religious leaders in ancient Mesopotamia conducted their own versions of exorcisms and Jewish people were performing them way before Jesus ever proclaimed, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And number five, new info. In 2021, the magazine, The Skeptical Inquirer, revealed the identity of Robbie Mannheim, the boy who was possessed in 1949 and inspired the exorcist. His real name was Ronald Hunkler. He was born June 1st, 1935, died a month before his 86th birthday, May 10th, 2020, Uh, For the remainder of his life, after the uh, demonic possession experience, Hunkler kept his past completely hidden and, according to multiple sources, lived in fear of being found out as the haunted boy from Maryland. He continued living in his home state of Maryland until his death and from the early 1960s all the way to 2001, worked as an engineer at NASA, uh, even patenting tech that helped shuttle panels withstand extreme levels of heat. Doesn't sound like the kind of person to have made it all up. Doesn't mean he did make it all up, but doesn't sound like somebody who did. Could the devil and demons or some type of paranormal and malevolent form of spiritual entity actually be real? Time suck. Top five takeaways. A history of exorcisms, how to rid yourself of demons has been sucked. Uh, Thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help making time suck. Thanks to Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, home boss, party planner. Thanks to the art warlock, Logan Keith, for recording today's episode. Thanks to Logan again for creating the merch at badmagicproductions.com. You can also uh, link to it through badmagicmerch.com still. Thank you to Molly Jean Box for the initial research. And thanks to the All Seen Eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page, the Mod Squad, making sure Discord keeps running smooth, and everyone over on the Time Sucks subreddit and Bad Magic subreddit. So many fantastic sacks doing so much within this community. And now, let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your time sucker updates. Complete and total maniac, Chris Williams. Fart survivor sack. <laughs> right in with a stinky but also sweet message. You'll see what I mean. 
Daniel, <laughs> there's no fucking way I apologize for the length of this email. And I give you three out of five stars. This is the celebration of a hero, the Pood Piper. I consider myself a highly educated man. You add up all the years I went to school, who else could repeat eighth grade thrice and senior year a couple of times? Your flatulent tale of the silencio lady. <laughs> oh, got me. I had to rewind twice to catch it. You fibbing fucker. I was, so I was so excited to hear of another lady person having an issue with the breeze between the knees. My mother was known for her raucous Bronx cheers. We called her, <laughs> we called her the war potato because she would sit on the plastic covered sofa smoking, watching Xena warrior princess and barking orders at her reluctant brute. We all know the slight lean a person does before they execute their quote raspberry beret. The foisting, of the, <laughs> the foisting up of the prominent cheek, the uncurled lip with the grimace of the cheek, art. My mother, she would announce the incoming, quote, bunny hunt by executing a shoulder dip from her sitting position, ass just to skew on the plastic, like, <laughs> like lips on a flute, and exhale loudly as she expelled her, quote, Pillsbury dough biscuits. They never stank. But as she smoked unfiltered Paul Malls, she would emit a faint puff of smoke. No, the act was not in itself offensive. It was a sound. Us kids would <laughs> us kids would guess what each batch of butt dust was saying. Each mouse on the Play-Doh exhibited the tones of speech. One, the crescendo of a question. Two, the trivial statement. And three, the dreaded exclamation point. Here are the popular balloon knot statements <laughs> we remember to this day. One, dog died like a harumph. Uh, two, hmm, that's a long hallway. Brrr, squish flat. Three, disease, like a door the dad of a teenage girl slams so hard it does not shut. I had a last wish, a final wish. If you read this email, please shout out my siblings, Carrie, Josh, Amy, Abby, and Mandy. It would make our year as we prepare for our mother's memorial in the spring by vlogging us, all taking a bite of a Wendy's Baconator, with all, <laughs> with all who loved and endured her with t-shirts, the world was her ashtray. Yours in ass, oldest bro, Chris. P.S. I have inherited some of her orifice acumen. <laughs> Only all my rim shots say, keep on sucking. Hard slap, burning refrain, and a bewildering and enduring lip clap. <laughs> my God, Chris, that email was art. I laughed so hard when I first read all that. Uh, your mom sounds like she was funny as hell. I love that you and your siblings <laughs> made your mom's farts into a fucking game. Bunny hunt? Pillsbury dough biscuits? Uh, Carrie, Josh, Amy, Abby, and Mandy, what a fun family you have. May your mom rest in peace. I hope she's up in some type of heaven somewhere just farting her funny ass off on a plastic couch. Hail Nimrod, you beautiful weirdos. Uh, next up, uh, elderly protecting super sucker, Becca, last name redacted, writes in regarding last week's Lady of Silence episode. I guess it was uh, it was two weeks ago. Uh, excuse me. Um, as you hear this, greetings, Lord and Savior, Suckmaster. You can call me Becca. No last name for professional reasons. I'm a longtime listener, first time writer, and elder abuse investigator. That's so cool. Uh, the Lady of Silence Suck was definitely a hard one for me to listen to, and I'll give you some background as to why. And then I want to tell you about some funny moments in my career. I graduated college with a BS in criminal justice. After school, I worked as a case manager for a residential treatment program for CYS. And then I worked for a program called Family Finding. Essentially, I got paid to Facebook stalk people and build family trees for families in the system. I burned out and left the world of CYS and moved on to the next vulnerable demographic, the elderly. I started working as an older adult protective service worker a few years ago. I investigate physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. I mean, that's so sad. Uh, as well as reports of neglect and financial exploitation. Uh, I've seen some shit literally and figuratively, and I've been through some shit liter literally and figuratively. I've helped people escape from their abusive homes in brief windows of opportunity uh, when their abuser was out of my house. I've traced scammers to the best of my ability. I've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with hospitals advocating for my people. I've assisted with guardianships. I work in tandem with local and state law enforcement agencies. I've even helped state police work a missing persons case. Most importantly, I've seen so, so, so many naked elderly people. I've always had a dark and morbid sense of humor. And I credit that for keeping me as sane as my brain will allow. So let me give you some examples of when I found humor in this job. One, I love the pleasantly demented. You know who I'm talking about. The older adults with dementia, Alzheimer's, TBI, etc., who are just happy to be here. I'm not a medical professional. I can't diagnose, but I can perform some cognitive evaluations to determine if I'm going to allow someone to sign documents. 
and to have an idea about the direction the interview was going in. One question that I asked 99% of the time is, who is the current president of the United States? I recently had an older adult answer that question with, quote, the Jewish one. <laughs> they then proceed to add, but I know for certain the Queen of England, uh, but I know for certain the Queen of England is Elizabeth. Now I had this interaction a couple months ago. I uh, didn't have the heart to break it to them. They were just way too excited about Queen Elizabeth. Uh, two, romance scams are so fucking abundant. I had a case back in the fall where the older adult believed themselves to be in a romantic relationship with retired U.S. Army General Austin Miller, <laughs> a man whose image and name is infamously known to be used in romance scams. In fact, there are dozens of Facebook groups dedicated to exposing General Austin Miller catfish. Why is this hilarious? Because old people will never get the hang of social media. These groups are, of course, public. And honestly, I can't believe this entertainment is free. <laughs> These groups are a pretty good 50-50 split between people currently enthralled in the scam and those who are spreading awareness of the scam. It's almost a cage match between people defending their love and others basically asking them why they're so gullible. Sunday, 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 Cat Lady Carol versus Bible Study Barb in the comment section. Who will take home the championship belt? Lonely, love struck Carol or recently catfished by a Nigerian Barb? We'll sell you the whole seat, but you only need the edge. That's awesome. Three, every time I go on vacation, my cases go off the rails. The day before I went on vacation, I had attempted to file a 302 and voluntary psychiatric hold on an older adult presenting significant harm to themselves and others. They were taken to the hospital and I had requested a urine test because I believe they had a UTI that was exasperating the mental health concerns. I was immediately put on the ER social worker's shit list. Spent the rest of the day being berated and insulted for forcing this poor little older adult into the hospital. Turns out the 302 was denied and they were discharged without doing a single test. I'm literally six hours into my vacation the next day when I get a call from my supervisor telling me that this older adult ran their adult child over with their car immediately after being discharged. The adult child was injured but recovered. They sent the older adult back to the hospital and that psych hold was promptly granted and guess what? They had a UTI. I was very smug with the hospital social workers when I returned from vacation and relished in their embarrassment. I don't know, meat sacks, just do your jobs and I won't have to laugh at you being humbled by your own negligence. There are other fun stories like the time I had a gun trained on me, almost being beaten with a cane after serving a court order, and the time I argued on behalf of my older adult with a high-ranking state police officer in the middle of an emergency room. Maybe I'll write again someday with those stories. On a more serious note, while I find humor, I also acknowledge that my job is dangerous. I don't have a service weapon. My only defense uh, is my wit, instincts, clipboard, and pen. Your podcast is a testament to how depraved and violent the world can be. Every week I tune in, learn, and apply. Before I go out to a home, I'll look it up on Google Earth, figure out at least a couple ways to escape the property either on foot or in my car. I email my entire agency when I leave for a visit and where I'm going so someone can check on me. Whenever I get a gut feeling, I listen and I get the fuck out by making an excuse about running late for another meeting. I've had state and local police accompany me on visits for my safety. I just want you to know that I'm laughing, but I'm safe while I'm doing it. Just as a rule of thumb, meat sacks, remember that people have done a lot more for a lot less, so watch your back. I hope you had a good laugh. And if you don't read this during Time Sucker updates, that's okay. But it'd be super cool if you do. I've lost my last marble, Becca. P.S. Wake up. There's a gas leak. <laughs> Becca. Oh my God, I love you. Uh, you are so funny. Uh, you're doing good shit and you don't take any shit. You hate incompetence and others. You also clearly care so much about your clients. Uh, I love hearing from awesome people like yourself and I'm glad you're being careful. Yeah. Some fucking real psychos in the world like Carl Watts and Juana Barraza. People who just kill you just for the fuck of it. Just because you remind them of somebody or just because they're fucking crazy shit. Stay safe. And I hope to hear from you again. And now Maggot Meat Sack Jeff, last name redacted, wants to teach us a thing or two about maggots. How they're good for us. He writes, hey Dan, or whichever team member decided to click on that subject line. I've been listening to Time Sucks to 2019 when I had a job on a golf course and mowed for eight hours a day. Eventually music got boring, so I started looking for a podcast, found your Russian sleep experiment episode, and I've been hooked ever since. Oh, thank you. Anyways, it's the first time I've sent anything in since I've had nothing interesting to say until now. Did you know that adding maggots to an infected wound and bandaging that area to keep them in can save your life? On the Hugh Glass episode, yeah, that short suck, uh, you mentioned that when the Sioux Indians found him, they helped nurse him back to health, which involved removing maggots from his bear wounds. This sounds like uh, the most putrid shit, and it actually might be, but there's a major benefit. There's a technique called maggot therapy, which involves letting maggots into a large wound since they will only target and eat dead tissue. This was first documented by doctors in Napoleon's army who noticed that soldiers with maggot-infested injuries were living longer than soldiers with similar injuries, which were already cleaned. Since the rotting flesh was completely eaten away, the infection spread much more slowly, and swelling was seen to decrease. 
I wonder if this was something taught to Hugh whenever he lived with the Indians and he intentionally kept the maggots in. The most fascinating part to me is that this isn't just some sort of uh, old remedy. This practice can be so effective that it's still used in some situations today. On a totally different note, if you slow your podcast down to 0.5 speed, you sound absolutely hammered. Sometimes my employees and I slow down your podcast to hear you stumble through the details of a murder and laugh our asses off. Also, I really enjoy the new short sucks, but can't believe you didn't go with quickie quickies for the name. Just adding some fuel to your dirty, dirty mind for shame. If uh, the ch- In the chance you add this to your Time Sucker updates, it would be awesome if you could give a shout out to my buddy Cooper, who falls asleep to Time Suck, my buddy Tyler, who listens with me at work, and my fiance Brooklyn, whose 21st birthday is tomorrow. Jeff. Uh, Jeff, man, thanks for sharing that info, dude. I appreciate it. Had no idea maggots were so uh, helpful. I always just thought they were pretty fucking disgusting. Uh, Cooper, what strange dreams you must have. I uh, hope they're not like Carl Watts dreams. Tyler, uh, thanks for joining in with Jeff, uh, enjoying these weird tales of work. And hail Lucifina, Brooklyn. I've always loved that name. Hope you and Jeff are enjoying being engaged at such a special time. Uh, and finally, last message, uh, firefighting sack Bryson J. Breedlove wants to get pooped on. He loves it. He loves to get pooped on. Bryson J. Breedlove is a poop lover. I'll let him explain. He writes, well, fuck me, meat sack on high. <laughs> I was in the midst of my 72-hour shift. I am a firefighter slash paramedic in California and just happened to be re-listening to the Jeffrey Lundgren series when my captain asked me if I wanted to lead a workout. I paused your wonderful podcast, headed over to the workout room where five other fellow firefighters were awaiting me. Without even thinking about it, I hooked up my phone to the speaker and pressed play. Much to my, my fellow firefighters' shock, we were not met with any sort of metal music. Instead, we were met with the dulcet tones of you, Dan Cummins, crooning to us with the words, I do you want to get pooped on? I do you want to get pooped on? I nearly pooped on my own self and quickly turned my phone off. Needless to say, I had so many, <laughs> needless to say, I had many questions to answer and none of which were answered by fast forwarding to the episode to show everyone it was just a podcast. Fuck my life and fuck you. JK, I love you. Three out of five experience, respectfully. Bryson J. Breedlove, firefighter slash paramedic. I love it, Bryson. Uh, whatever music I found online to sing uh, that little stupid jingle to is weirdly catchy. I also sometimes have that pop into my head. And I, and I don't. even I don't want to get pooped on, but I will sing sometimes. Do you want to get pooped on? Uh, do you want to get pooped on? Uh, thanks for doing what you do. Keep saving lives and try not to get pooped on. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thank you for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. Scared to death, time suck each week. Uh, short sucks and nightmare fuel on the time suck and scared to death feeds some weeks. Try not to get possessed by any demons this week. Don't enroll in any satanic schools. Take it easy on Harry Potter and keep on sucking. <laughs> Magic Productions. Hey everyone, it's me, the demon Carl Watts, the artist formerly known as the Sunday Morning Slasher, former client of Ron Kaplovitz. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I certainly did. My favorite part was when the boy was tormented by the demon. I also greatly enjoyed watching The Pope's Exorcist with Russell Crowe. Everything was good except the ending. I was rooting for the demons. Anyway, I hope you see me soon. I want to I wanna see your eyes, your evil eyes, and I want to close them. And grab your Ouija board and hit me up if you want to talk and play. And let me make you into a beautiful butterfly. Okay. Uh, I think that was enough creepy shit for today.